Okay, and we have that on our form, so that uh, is available. Thank you. Okay, I'll just hang out on mute, and I guess when we get to number seven, Eric can recognize. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Transportation Planning Organization for Wednesday, June 8th, 2022. Uh, we are going to begin with a Pledge of Allegiance, if we could all rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and can we please begin with a roll call? Commissioner Cohen? Here. Commissioner Kemp? Here. Commissioner Overman? Here. Commissioner Myers? Here. Commissioner Smith? Here. Councilman Maniscalco? Here. Councilman Citro? Here. Councilman Hertak? Um, Councilwoman Hertak, here. I'm sorry, Council Member. Mayor Ross? Here. Commissioner Kilton? Here. Joe Lapano? Adelie Legrand? Here. Greg Slater? Here. Charles Kluge? Here. We do have an in-person quorum. Chair, would you please call for a consent vote for remote participation? Uh, yes, and at this time, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion of consent for remote uh, member participation for Ms. Legrand. We have a, a motion from I think it was Councilman Maniscalco and maybe Commissioner Kemp, uh, um, seconded by uh, Councilman Citro. We can do a voice vote on that. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, Ms. Legrand, uh, kindly raise your hand um, on the, uh, on the uh, machine that you have, and we will uh, do our best to make sure that we can see you. Oh, okay. Got it. There you go. Okay. Uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion for approval of the minutes of the May 11th, 2022 meeting. Motion by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Commissioner Kemp. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Uh, items other than the tip. So if you are speaking on anything on our agenda, not including the tip, this would be uh, your moment. We have three minutes set aside. If there is anyone here, there's not anyone signed up virtually for this part of the public comment. Is there anyone in the room? Okay, I don't see anyone. So we're gonna move on to committee reports and advance comments, and we can start with Bill Roberts, who is our CAC chair. Chairman, uh, members of the TPO board, I'm Bill Roberts, I chair your Citizens Advisory Committee. I have a report of our uh, meeting from June the 1st, 2022. Uh, we had a quorum of our committee uh, and virtual participation was approved uh, for non-members that are members that were not present. Uh, we had considerable discussion about several items in the tip, as you might well imagine. The CAC has discussed this item on at least three different occasions. Uh, we had two regular meetings. Um, and uh, a really uh, robust uh, workshop in addition to our regular meetings. Um, at our meeting on June 1st, uh, we heard from two persons, both by emails, uh, in which one citizen expressed concerns about the toxic dust created by the construction on Interstate 275 uh, north of, of the I-4 junction. Uh, the CAC uh, passed three motions at our meeting in June. Uh, we recommended to the board that the FDOT items uh, 440511-7 and 440511-8 uh, be removed from the tip as a result of the removal of the BRT lanes on Florida and Tampa streets. Uh, those having been deferred because they have been transferred uh, to Hart. Uh, FDOT's Justin Hall uh, joined us virtually and explained to the committee that the road improvements included in those TIP um, uh, provisions uh, are needed to make possible the BRT lanes on those two streets. Uh, and then the, 
the CAC had two recommendations to the board requesting the DOT provide specific explanation about the intent to impose tolls on the proposed express lanes to be built on the Howard Franklin Bridge and the segment between downtown and West Shore. Uh, we discussed at some length the funds budgeted for construction of the West Shore interchange. Uh, it was not clear to a number of our committee members that the funding uh, as described uh, in your tip before you uh, for that interchange is budgeted through the five-year work program. Uh, this was leading some committee members uh, to question uh, why it had reached the point of no return. Uh, Justin Hall of DOT joined the meeting virtually and explained how the five-year work program uh, work, works and how it is represented uh, in the tip that you'll be considering tonight. The CAC discussed the downtown interchange plans which are line items 66 and 67 in your presentation materials. It was pointed out by a committee member that the two general purpose lanes north of the interchange were previously removed at the request of the TPO board. Uh, finally, a vote was taken to approve the TIP uh, and the CAC vice chair uh, expressed his opinion that our action to approve the TIP amounts to having rescinded a prior recommendation of the CAC regarding those two general purpose lanes north of the junction. Subsequently, an opinion by your legal counsel has affirmed the appropriateness of the CAC's action in, in recommending the tip to you this evening. Uh, so we have approved it, we recommend it, uh, and that concludes my report. I'll be happy to take any questions. Are there any Thank questions you, from board members? Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. DeVita Franklin uh, from TPO staff, I believe is here with some information on advanced comments prior to tonight's hearing. Good evening. Good evening. I'm DeVita Franklin, as you heard. Um, and here are your summary of commi committee reports and public comments. So pertaining to the action items, the Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, update and priority list was approved by the Technical Advisory Committee, the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee, and the Livable Roadways Committee. The Technical Advisory Committee questioned the timetable for the Del Mabry overpass, which is number 71 on table two, uh, for the list of uh, candidates for new funding. And they received clarification that the overpass is included in the State Road 60 interchange project with construction in 2030. The Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee confirmed that priorities come from jurisdictional applications and will complete projects already underway. And the Livable Roadways Committee passed a motion to consider the integration of transportation demand management strategies and commuter assistance into the process of allocating funds for the next TIP update. They also reflected on a previous motion to require that all projects should start with the Vision Zero lens and then apply other criteria. So for your summary of public comments, these comments were received through Facebook, Twitter, and email. So Jose Menendez and Jeff Redding did share concerns about the increasing rate of bicycle and pedestrian deaths in the county. Candace Savitz was concerned about toxic toxicity of construction dust at I-275. And Neil Constantino supports the NASA Regional Air Mobility Project in Tampa and also supports repurposing the soon to be demolished segment of the Howard Franklin Bridge as a solar array or pedestrian greenway. Anj Bott lives in Valrico and suggests that commuter rail along CSX tracks can help ease worsening traffic congestion. And Peter Crosby says to build more transit, plant more trees, preserve historic neighborhoods, and stop overbuilding south of Gandhi Boulevard. Andrew Morris requests support for passenger rail to Pinellas County. Mauricio Rosas opposes land use policies that create sprawling suburbs because they are a detriment to Vision Zero. Chris Vela opposes non-elective seats and, and state legislators determining future projects. And Hillsborough County Commissioner Gwen Myers thanked the TPO for attending her town hall meeting. Corrine Leinbrink thanked the TPO staff uh, members Johnny Wong and Connor McDonald for presenting to the Ebor Community Rede Redevelopment Area Committee. 
And Pedal Power Promoters congratulated the TPO for Plan Hillsboro's award from the League of American Bicyclists. So please note that the, atta um, the attachments that you received uh, earlier today from Cheryl Wilkening, they do have these comments in full that I summarized, and this concludes my report. Thank you. And you will be back with us a little later in the program with the comments on the tip. Yes, I will. All right, we'll see you then. Uh, we have a consent agenda with two items on it. Can we have a motion to move that, please? So moved. We have a motion from Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Commissioner Kemp. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you very much. So tonight we have our public hearing to, uh, to consider the Transportation Improvement Program, uh, or TIP, annual update. And we're gonna start with a staff presentation by Johnny Wong of the TPO staff. And after that, we will move on to public comment on the TIP. Good evening, board members. Johnny Wong, TPO staff, and I'm the TIP program manager. Happy to be here tonight to update you uh, or provide you with a status update on the um, transportation Improvement Program. This one applies to fiscal years 22-23 through 26-27. So first, I want to say that this presentation is broken down into five sections. The first section is very brief, but I wanted to give you an idea of the kind of information that we're presenting to our advisory committees in the community to better help them understand what the TIP is and the purpose behind it. So we provide them with a landscape. Uh, basically explaining to them how to understand what the TIP is, and I like to explain it as, um, as follows. It is three lists, beginning with a list of priorities funded for construction. Um, so table one in your packet is a list of priorities that have already been evaluated. We believe that they will have a positive benefit to the community, and they are funded for construction sometime between the years 2022 and 2027. The second table of the TIP is a list of projects that have been evaluated, and we also believe that they will have positive benefits to the community, hence they've become priorities, and they're currently seeking funding for the specific phase of project development that's identified in the table. And then lastly, the most uh, lengthy table in the TIP is table three, and that is an aggregate of all of the local governments capital improvements programs as well as the DOT work program. It's important to note that because these are pro uh, mostly projects funded with local dollars, the TPO doesn't really have a discretion to revise any of the programs that are listed in Table 3. We also explain the process that we go through for developing the TIP priority list. Um, we follow this process very strictly and we take the process very seriously. We begin by having consultation meetings with each of the local governments very early in the year, usually sometime between January and February. We solicit a list of priorities from each of the local governments. Once we have the list of their requested projects, we sort them into one of our five investment categories that have been identified in the Long Range Transportation Plan. Once they're sorted, we seek out the best available data and try to determine what the anticipated benefits will be upon that project's completion. And then we, um, based on that data, sort them according to rank, or we rank them according to which we believe will have the biggest benefit to the community. But our work doesn't end there. Um, of course, once the TIP priority list is set and the TPO board approves it, we work with our partners um, throughout the rest of the year to try to find funding to move these projects forward. Um, so that's a new addition to the TIP table two that many of you haven't seen before. As a result of the new infrastructure bill, there are a number of new funding programs. And so in one of the columns on table two, you'll see a lot of acronyms that you may not be familiar with. Those are funding codes, and we've spelled out what they stand for um, in, the, in the footnote. Some of the more important um, uh, funding codes to pay attention to are carbon reduction federal funds, CRFF. We believe that those are pretty important because projects that um, could alleviate congestion and have a benefit to air quality are mostly what's eligible for that pot of funds. Safe Streets for All is another one that has huge uh, benefit and we're looking to capitalize on that by working with our local governments to produce um, a collaborative uh, grant application. Um, second section is to discuss the highlights from table one. 
again, this is a list of projects that have been prioritized and they now have funds for construction some by, sometime between 2022 and 27. A number of projects have been removed from Table 1 from last year to this year as a result of being completed, thankfully. And uh, I have those bulleted out on the slide in front of you. The first is Bush Boulevard resurfacing project from Armenia to Florida. The second is a downtown advanced traffic management system project uh, in the city of Tampa. The third is Armenia Ave to Bush Boulevard. I believe that's a safety project. Uh, East Hillsborough Ave from Central to 56. Columbus from Nebraska to 14th and 46 from Bush Boulevard to Fowler are all walk bike safety projects. Hillsborough Ave from Memorial Highway to Church is another safety project. Green Spine Phase 3A is a multi-use trail project from Nebraska to 7th Ave, Dale Mabry from Sly to Van Dyke, US 301 from Falkenberg to Sly, Lutz Lake Fern Trail Connector, and a Real Choices When Not Driving project on Columbus from Rome to North Boulevard. We also added about a dozen projects to Table 1 this year, so they have uh, funds programmed for construction, and they are Green Spine Phase 2B, a safety project on Dale Mabry from Mango to Pearl Ave, safety project on Fowler from I-275 to I-75, one on Twigs from Ashley to Nebraska, one on US-41 Nebraska from Kennedy to Bears, Hillsboro Ave from Veterans to I-275, Spruce Street and Boy Scout Boulevard from the airport service road out to Dale Mabry. And those are all projects that will enhance the flow of traffic and ease congestion. Traffic signal project on Adamo Drive at 26th Street, an intersection project at Alexander Street, James L. Redmond Parkway out in Plant City, Summon Greenway Trail project from 17th to 19th. It's actually a trailhead project. Cross Bay Ferry operational funds. Uh, I believe Hart won a grant to purchase a boat for that service. Um, some <clears throat> funds for West Shore Interchange, moving that project forward, Downtown Interchange, and then I-275 from MLK to Hillsboro. Moving into Table 2, um, I want to first call attention, before we get into the details of the project, some changes to Table 2 that you may not uh, have seen last year. We added uh, and cleaned up quite a few of the columns in this table, beginning with the first red circle to the left side of the slide that says project status and request. Um, we have evaluated the projects and tried to clarify, make more evident what phase of the project is seeking funds. Um, in the past, we didn't take a lot of care to identify whether it's seeking planning funds or PD&E or design or construction. We tried to make that abundantly clear so that folks really know what their money is going for. The second red circle in the middle is the suggested funding type. And as I discussed, there are a bunch of new grant opportunities out there. So we're helping our uh, local governments keep track of the opportunities by identifying which ones we think the project would be eligible for. And of course, we're tracking that and we'll work with them throughout the year uh, to move their projects forward. And then to the furthest right is point of no return. And I think some of you may be familiar with this, but we were asked by our policy committee to flag any projects which if uh, they receive funding and the TIP is approved this year, will pass the point of no return. Um, passing the point of no return is uh, statutory language and our TPO attorney has advised us that once a project advances beyond, or two, I should say, the uh, design phase of preliminary engineering, it requires a joint action of the TPO and DOT to remove that project. Um, so when you're looking at table two in the furthest right, hand column, we've indicated with, uh, whether upon approval of the TIP, that project will require a joint action to remove or not. I hope that's all clear. All right, and uh, of course, the purpose of Table 2, why we go through such uh, great effort to produce it and keep it as clear as possible is because the TPO recognizes that we have a limited number of transportation funds and we want to do our best to rank them in order of uh, which projects will have the greatest benefit to the community. And then because the TPO controls approximately 20 to $27 million in federal funds every year, we want to make sure that we're allocating to the projects that will move the needle the most in areas that the community cares about. All right, so to get into it, there are five in investment categories that we um, use to identify projects and what their benefits are. The first is state of good repair and resilience. Most of the projects that get placed into this category are related to transit, asset maintenance, 
bridge preservation or resiliency projects, which could include stormwater, um, hardening uh, pavement to make it uh, more flood resistant. We had about, uh, we, well, not about, we had five submissions that we placed into the state of good repair category this year. Um, the first three are from Hart and they are bus replacements. Uh, as many of you know, we allocate about $4 million a year to Hart to replace some of its buses. Uh, the second request was for bus maintenance midlife overhaul, followed by bus stop capital repairs. We received a submission from T. Barta for some funds to operate its Vanpool program, and then City of Tampa submitted a project for Bayshore Boulevard seawall reconstruction. The Vision Zero program had quite a few submissions this year, and as a result of receiving so many submissions, and in part due to a conversation that we had with the Livable Roadways Committee earlier in the year, we had to adjust our methodology for ranking those projects. Um, because we've performed so poorly in safety over the past three or more years, we felt it was really important to move forward projects that are shovel ready. So our first sort for identifying projects to recommend funding for is construction readiness. So when you're looking at table two on the far right hand column, you'll see at the top of the list are projects requesting construction funds, followed by those requesting design and construction, followed by design, and then so on down the list. Once we sorted based on construction readiness, we looked at crash density, so the number of fatalities and serious injuries per mile, and then finally, um, we looked at what percent of the project upon complete will fall in an environmental justice community or a disadvantaged community. So the projects that we added to the Vision Zero priority list this year are some intersection projects on Hillsborough Ave, one at Sawyer Road and one at Town and Country Boulevard, a safety project on Lois Ave from Cleveland to Boy Scout Boulevard, some intersection projects along US 301 at Palm River Road, Harney, Stacy, McIntosh, and Sims Roads, one on Mango Road from MLK to US 92, uh, a collaborative project between the TPO and Hillsborough County on Lynn Turner Road from Ehrlich to Gunn Highway, another on 78th Street from Causeway Boulevard to Palm River, North 15th from Fowler to Fletcher, Fletcher Ave from Armenia to Nebraska, CR 39 at Lithia Pinecrest, a complete street study on Habana from MLK to Hillsborough, another on Azil Street from Dale Mabry to Armenia, safety project on Bird Street from Florida to Nebraska, 15th Street from Lake Ave to Palm, Manhattan from Gandhi to Euclid, Sheldon from Hillsborough to Waters, and McDill from Bay to Bay to Kennedy. Our third program is Smart Cities, and we reserve this program for Smart Cities technologies that can help improve flow on the network, uh, especially projects that reduce delay or improve reliability. So we added a project in downtown Tampa for signal replacements, a number of their signals are well past their useful life, uh, in some cases more than double their useful life, um, as well as a bridge controller project. Um, an intersection project at US 301 in Bomb Road, and signal replacements on some county roads that are running through the city of Tampa's boundaries. One at Cypress in Armenia, another at Cypress in Howard, Henderson at San Rafael in Lois, one at Habana in Columbus, Himes at Gandhi, Manhattan at El Prado, Manhattan at Beta Bay, and then Church at Beta Bay. Our Real Choices program enhances mobility, so we see a lot of trail, side path projects, transit service expansion. Because we received so many safety projects this year, and many of them wouldn't really be able to compete with funds, or compete for funds with some of the other higher ranking safety projects, we recognize that they still have benefits to the network by um, connecting parts of the network and um, other improvements. So for any safety project that did not have at least three fatalities or serious injuries per mile, we put those into the real choices category. The first project that we added to the list is 109th Ave from Nebraska to 30th Street, Ashley Drive from Tyler to Laurel, an intersection project at Dale Mabry and Spruce, Hannah Ave from Nebraska to 40th Street, 14th Street from Columbus to I-4, Main Street from Armenia to North Boulevard, a bike boulevard project on Gray Street from West Shore to Willow, an intersection project at Armenia and Barclay, Green Artery Segments D and E, a safety project at Waters and Florida Mining Boulevard, Brush Street from Whiting to Kenny is part of the Water Street development, Mango Road at Old Hillsborough Ave, 
and then we reserved a line item for FDOT. They are doing an inventory on sidewalk gaps on their network. Um, they don't have a full list of sidewalk gaps that need to be filled, but we opened that line item for them in case they have any available funds, they can go in and do those projects quickly. And lastly, major projects for economic growth. The types of projects that fall into this category are um, major, number one. Uh, those are often capacity additions. They could be fixed guideway transit projects. Otherwise, projects that are just prohibitively expensive for us to fund in other programs. So um, you see a lot of big projects that may have safety benefits or mobility benefits placed into this category. The first is Bro Rain Street Bridge Rehab, phase one of two. Next is Cass Street Bridge Repair. Next is Cross Bay Ferry Service, a safety project on 30th Street from Yukon to Fowler. And finally, a safety project on Inner Bay Boulevard from West Shore to Bay Shore. The next section is the second to last. These are highlights from table three. Table three, again, is huge because it's all of the local government CIPs and the DOT work program. Rather than going through all the details, we just summarize the projects. There are 78 state of good repair, i.e. infrastructure maintenance and resilience projects, 26 vision zero, 17 smart cities, seven real choices, mobility projects, 30 major projects, and 35 that fall into a miscellaneous category. Those could be herbicide applications, landscaping, things like that. This slide shows funding allocation according to project type. And the first thing that jumps out to you is that you see 48% of the funds spent in Hillsborough County are allocated toward major projects. Um, I wanna pause here because I think it's important to call out that um, this is uh, this is a summary of all of the money spent on transportation projects across all of Hillsborough County, whether that be FDOT, Hillsborough County, the three cities, T. Barta, Thea, it all falls in here. Um, it amounts to about $4 billion, and the TPO only controls slightly less than 2% of that. Um, so, um, of course, you all are slightly limited in how much money you can allocate to other types of projects. And based on the needs assessment, I'm sure you all know that our needs are huge, and compared to the amount of funding available, um, it seems very, very small. Um, however, as the needs assessment showed, if we had another funding source available, we would slowly be able to chip away at the needs and allocate some more money to other kinds of projects like Vision Zero, Smart Cities, and down the list. All right, to wrap up, next steps. Um, we have assembled this tip with coordination from all of our partners, both within Hillsborough County and around the region. We coordinated with all of the MPOs in West, in West Central Florida to produce a list of um, projects that might be eligible for transportation regional incentive program and the multi-use trail priority um, grant opportunities. Um, the list of TRIP and MUT projects will be presented to the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance this Friday. That's kind of important because for projects to be eligible for those regional pots of money, they also have to be adopted into each of the individual MPO, TPOs, TIPs. Um, I on the next slide, I'll show you a list of those projects. All of the projects in tables one and two have been reviewed by our partners in the county, the three cities, T. Barta, um, Hart, and we've re reviewed our funding recommendations with them and kind of talked about the projects that we're hoping to work with them to move forward in the coming years. This slide shows a list of those regional projects that I discussed that are to be included both in our tip and the regional uh, priority list. They're Big Bend Road, the bookends, US 41 to Covington Garden Drive, and then Simmons Loop to US 301, and some trail projects, South Coast Greenway, Upper Tampa Bay, Tampa Bypass, Adamo Drive, South Tampa Greenway, Howard Franklin Bridge uh, Trail Connections, Gandy Bridge Trail, and then the Dale Mabry Overpass. Um, as Davida shared, we presented the tip and the updated priority list to the Livable Roadways Committee, BPAC, they both recommended approval. We presented it to the CAC, they recommended approval, and the TAC just on Monday, they also recommended approval. Tonight, of course, the public hearing, and uh, following this conversation, we're gonna work with DOT to make sure that we're in compliance with all of the rules and regulations that apply to the TIP, and then uh, we're looking forward to submitting the final document um, maybe within the next month or so. The action item before you is the TIP update for the fiscal years I mentioned and the TIP priority list. 
staff's recommended action is to approve both of those. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you all and I'll be close at hand in case you have any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them. Mr. Wong, thank you. That was an excellent summary and uh, a great way to set the stage for tonight's hearing. Before we go to public comment and everyone will have an a, a chance to engage the staff uh, with whatever questions or comments they have after public comment, but is there anything that anyone needs to say before we open up for public comment tonight? I don't see anybody. So let me say I have a list here uh, in front of me of people that have signed up for public comment. We have three minutes set aside uh, per speaker. And uh, our first, um, most of our commentators will be appearing virtually. Some are here in person. But our first three are Kathleen Eldridge, Christopher Hatton, and then Rick Fernandez. So we're going to go to Kathleen Eldridge first. But our first three are Kathleen Eldridge, Christopher Hatton, and Kathleen did not sign into the meeting. Oh, she did not sign into the meeting. All right. Well, uh, our next uh, speaker is Christopher Hatton. Chris, are you there? Mr. Hatton had signed in earlier. Uh, I don't know if he logged off. Okay, we'll double back on that. Our next speaker is Rick Fernandez, and if he doesn't appear, I'm gonna think that maybe there's some sort of technical problem. Is, is <laughs> Mr. Fernandez there? <laughs> I have to laugh. Uh, it, Commissioner, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. It's nice to hear from you. Okay, well, little favors. All right. Uh, greetings, uh, Rick Fernandez. I'm out of Tampa Heights, your CAC Vice Chair. I incorporate by reference my written comments. My principal ask tonight is that you strike the three DTI lane movements, making up the quick fix project in tip table one. Those are, yeah. those are your no FDN numbers, 0561, 0562, and 0571. There are other very important concerns, including dedicated transit lanes on Tampa and Florida, retention walls along the eastern boundary of Tampa Heights, and at several underpasses in Tampa Heights and Seminole Heights. We've been talking about these things for months, even years in some cases. Frankly, in all fairness, I must say I am disappointed by this board's lack of engagement with the community thus far. I hope for more from you, especially the locally elected class. To you elected members, what would a vote advancing the TIP as presented by staff tonight say about you? To me, it would say this, that you approve further expansion of a monument to Jim Crow era racism and an environmental polluter. It would suggest that you approve displacement of individuals from their homes in VME board, intrusion of interstate retention walls in Tampa Heights, disruption of residents' quiet enjoyment and threats to their health and safety all along the urban interstate corridor, devaluation and damage to private property, FDOT's disregard for historic preservation and community standards, there, think of 1902 Lamar and the sloping underpass retention walls that we have talked about frequently. Abandonment of dedicated transit lanes for BRT on Florida and Tampa. And the abysmal failure that has permeated FDOT's and TPO's public outreach related to the quick fix project. And that's just for starters. A vote for this year's tip as presented is a nod to the wrong-headed notion that we in urban Tampa exist for the convenience of regional and even national interests. The consequences of your decisions are facing us locally every day. Some days we actually hear, see, and feel them. I can assure you, you are seldom far from our thoughts. Strike the three DTI lane movements in table one. Stop the intrusion of, it, of retention walls in Tampa Heights. Support the dedicated transit lanes on Tampa Street and Florida Avenue. 
and step into the discussion regarding vertical retention walls at Florbraska, Lake Osborne, and Chelsea underpasses. Thank, I see the balance thank you very of my much, time. Rick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is James Dunbar. Oh, and he's here in person. Hi. Hello. Thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, I am a resident and also I work along Tampa Street. So representing my organization between Tampa and Florida, definitely excited to see some of the changes that are on the agenda to make it more safe. I've worked there for 10 years and I've seen many, many fatalities along those corridors. Three lane highways in each direction. I drove here from the cro on the Crosstown and realized that the roads in front of my house and work are wider than the Crosstown that it took to get here. And speeds in which are driven on these three lane roads in each direction are astronomical. I see in one of the areas, um, the, or the Florida Avenue, Tampa Street um, one, going from Tyler to Florabraska. Some of these changes will make a great impact through the southern part of the Heights and really create some more safety-oriented uh, items for, for walkability and then also the dedicated bus lane and the sidewalks. What doesn't make sense to me is north of Florida, Nebraska to MLK. So MLK, um, the high, Highlands Tampa crossover has been reduced to two lanes. That's a great project to make that a lot safer. But then from Florabraska down will be reduced to two lanes with dedicated. So there's a half mile stretch. I happen to live on that half mile stretch between Florabraska and MLK, which as slated will still be a three lane highway through a neighborhood. Um, I see extending further up Florida. There's lots of plans for that. Don't see anything for this half mile stretch between Florabraska and MLK that'll stay three lanes with two above it, two below it. It's really all I have to say. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Emil Carr Blake. Emil Carr Blake did not sign into the meeting. Okay. Mauricio Rosas. Mauricio Rosas did not sign on. Oh, he's office. here. He's here. Now, thank you, I, thank you Mr. Oh, Chair. My, my understanding is that there are people that are on that are going to donate time to Mr. Rosas. So let me call through them and um, make sure that they're here. Susan Long. Oh, she's here. Oh, hi, Susan. Okay. Um, Myron Griffin. Okay. Um, Mr. Griffin, are you on? Myron Griffin, can you unmute yourself? Myron Griffin, if you can hear us, this is HTV. Okay. Um, Michelle Cookson. I'm here. And Laron Barber. Yes, I'm here. And I believe there was one other, and that is, um, and hold on, there is one more, uh, Bobby Creighton. I, I am here. Okay, virtually. so that would be, by my count, uh, five people. So that is 15 minutes, um, plus, plus yours, you have 18 minutes, but you know, obviously in the, in the interest of time, uh, use them judiciously. Yeah, of course. Or, Thank of course. you. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Board. Uh, I want to first thank the uh, Chair and his staff, along with Ms. Gina Torres and HTV, for making sure that we are able to uh, play this video. The video is actually uh, several different constituents who can't be here tonight, uh, and it's important to have the visual as part of that, so I'm very grateful that everything was, uh, was made to accommodate <clears throat> this. Um, the other thing I also want to uh, say thank you to Secretary Wynn 
since his coming here, he's actually opened up the doors to FDOT, something that we did not have as citizens before. Uh, and it's a, it's a difficult relationship, too, because he has to deal, he's having to deal with civil servants, and citizens are having to deal with civil servants, and we really don't know how to talk with one another. And so it's a very difficult thing. So I'm glad that he's here and that he's doing his best to try to make this work. And that's the biggest thing, is trying to make this work. The other issue that we really have to reckon with is the issue of racism and discrimination in the highway and how it came to be. Do you know that Dobieville, how many here in this room know Dobieville? Dobieville used to be part of West Hyde Park. It's now underneath Selman Highway. Central Avenue. Central Avenue used to be the hub of the African American community. It's now paved underneath the highway. And the people who were affected by that in what was called the scrubs in Central Avenue, they were promised that they, were, they, would, be, they would get some kind of housing that was going to be in Robles Park. That housing that's there in Robles Park was white only housing. Now, how do I know this history? The Planning Commission has a book. The Department of Transportation has several books on this, and I think it's very, very important that as we all engage in this, that we are sensitive to those issues because the people affected by that are still alive today. And if they're not alive, they were, they, 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 their children are, and they experienced it. Former County Commissioner Les Miller, he was affected by it. So, I think it's very important that whether it's the civil servants, elected officials, staffers, to help work with the community when these issues of racism are being, uh, being thrown out, that we understand. This came from someone by the name of Robert Moses in New York. And we recently had someone here last night from New York who did the opposite of what Robert Moses did. Do you know that today in New York City, Instead of driving a car on Times Square, you actually can sit down in the middle of Times Square, have lunch, wave to the camera, and here in Tampa, we are at a crucial point to build infrastructure the same way that New York City did back in the, late, in the early 1900s. If we don't build that infrastructure today, we're going to continue with the same land use policies of sprawl and sprawl and sprawl. And that's one reason why we cannot get meaningful mass transit within this corridor. The best, if we continue with these same policies, the best that we're going to be able to do is have zoning type bus systems. Uh, Orange County has that in the outlying areas where people don't use a lot of bus and they're sprawl. They have little mini buses going around and stuff. Because if we continue building South County, we continue building Basco County the way we are, we're digging ourselves in, in the hole. And I really think that, you know, let's stop being so upset about this racism thing. Let's just embrace it. Let's talk about it. You know, why? Why are people upset about it? You'll watch this video, you'll hear people who live in that area, and they'll tell you exactly how they feel. And I, last thing, too. I want to, I'm going to pick on East Tampa for a moment. Do you know East Tampa is called a food desert? A food desert is where there's no viable grocery stores, like a Winn-Dixie, a Publix. You go Nebraska, east down to 50th Street, no grocery stores. What do people have to do? They have to drive somewhere. <clears throat> and that's not right. We need to be doing more for our communities, especially in East Tampa. We need to bring back like the Sears building, <laughs> which is now Irwin Votech. We need to recognize that. I have a friend, Myron Griffin, from the Old Seminole Heights <clears throat> uh, Neighborhood Association, and also he's working with the East Tampa Heights Aesthetics <clears throat> and Beautification Committee to propose moving forward with an art project for East Tampa. We're working with uh, Dr. Good from the Irwin Votek Center and a, um, uh, a well-known artist, uh, Terry Claren. He did much, much, a lot of work here at Hillsborough County Schools. And we're going to come up with at least the first of an art project at Irwin Votek, a place-making place. On that note, back to placemaking, 
one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is what will the final product look for 275 as it's being widened and expanded and things are being done on the underpasses. Back in October, we began the discussion saying, listen, those underpasses need to be vertical. Well, no, because we didn't do the full whole thing. We, we didn't do the full reconstruction. Well, it shouldn't just be left up to the full reconstruction. If you're going to produce a product, I want FDOT staff to be proud of what they are doing. There's one picture that I don't have here, a visual for you, but it's a project that was done on Highway 50 up by Brooksville area up there. And Justin Hall, who's in the audience, he, it's his baby, and he's really proud of it. It looks pretty, it looks beautiful. I want that same feeling for the city of Tampa. I want that same feeling for the engineers, the civil servants who are working on this project. We should not be shortchanging beautification and aesthetics for just a quick fix. No, it needs to, if we're doing a quick fix, okay, quick fix, but let's make it just as beautiful. Lastly, we need trees along the highway. <laughs> we need trees to make the area more hospitable. Trees on East Hillsborough Avenue. It's, it's, you walk there and as, as, as Councilman Good says, East Hillsborough Avenue looks like a dump. That's what he said. And he asked FDOT, please come back to us and give us a, a uh, beautification. That, that still hasn't happened, but, but we, I do believe that we're working closely with Craig Fox and others at FDOT that we will reach an agreement as to what is being done. Somebody asked me to please speak a little bit about Nebraska Avenue. I'll mention Nebraska. <clears throat> They're looking for more trees as well, make it more pedestrian friendly. And I know that FDOT has or, is, already has a plan. It just hasn't been released. I, I happen to have uh, the slides for it, but Truthfully, until I talk to Justin, I don't know what those slides mean at all. Uh, so I'm not going to elaborate on that, but I know that there are some things already in the works. And lastly, before the video, please remember, the only way we're going to get to Vision Zero is by reducing the number of cars on the road. That is the only way that we are going to reduce fatalities, crashes, and pollution by reducing the number of cars on the road. Thank you. And hit play. <laughs> and what are your concerns? Uh, my concerns are that the changes that they're proposing are not necessarily to help or uplift East Tampa proper. Mm -hmm. The residents of East Tampa, I think, um, the changes are going on around them mm -hmm. so as to create almost uh, an enclosure. Yeah, um, following up on that, uh, it was Councilman Goods who said Hillsborough, East Hillsborough Avenue looks like a dump. Yes. If you go, you get off of 275 and you want to go east, you look, and what do you see when you... I actually live off of East Hillsborough and 40th Street. Okay. I live in that area. From Hillsborough and Nebraska to Hillsborough and Orient Road. Mm -hmm. There are probably one or two pawn shops every two blocks. Every two blocks. And what do pawn shops sell? They sell handguns in our neighborhood. So we're wondering why there's so much shooting and killing going on every two blocks. We need to limit that. The owners of those um, businesses do not live in East Tampa, nor do they hire residents of East Tampa at a, a large rate. Mm -hmm. um, those kind of things are not making our community the best that it can be. Do you think the highway has something to do with this? The highway is closing East Tampa in. Hmm. What may help 
um, is the city center being brought into that area. Oh, Hannah and 22nd. Hannah, Hannah near 22nd. I'm uh -huh. six blocks away from there. Okay. Um, they're building new apartments now all of a sudden uh, in conjunction with what's going on there. Um, Are they doing anything to the roads that you know? I have noticed in my neighborhood there are more stop signs everywhere. Uh, areas that used to be thoroughfares, there's now a four-way stop, like every four blocks. Now, how is that mitigating um, traffic? I don't know. Um, but what I do notice is they're not adding sidewalks to beautify or help the community. They're not adding, um, they're not widening streets. I don't know that they can because of the dense population there. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to be a benefit to us in that area. Um, but we'll see. So, uh, my first question to you is, uh, Brene, mm -hmm. are you a lifetime resident of this area? Uh, have, um, how long have you been here? No, I've been here since 83. We were stationed in Maine Air Force Base. My first husband with my small children. Oh. Uh, we came from up uh, Midwest, Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, stationed at Warner Robins, Georgia. Oh. I've been to Germany. Oh. Okay. Wow. So we were here on a tour and uh, I ended up staying and I've been here since 83. Okay. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what do you think that this highway project is doing uh, for for East Tampa? What's, it, what's going on here? Uh, I really don't see what's it's doing for East Tampa. I see what it may be doing it for outside skirts of East Tampa, but uh, it never really benefits us. Uh, I was in this meeting, I heard about a lot of the walls, colors, and you know, but uh, we lost 40th Street, we lost 34th exit now. They're looking at cutting off 21st and uh, moving it down the 14th, you're taking a lot of the entrances that can take you to businesses that need assistance. Uh, I have a business that I've been in. What's the name um, of your business? Ladies of the Sea. Ladies and of the so Sea. It's been 26 years now working on it. Okay. Since 1996. So um, you're you're moving the ability for the traffic, for the tourists, um, the tours to come in and be able to patronize the, the businesses. Mm -hmm. We need more help in the East Tampa area where my business is at. It's right here. Wait, what do you think, so what did you recommend to them? What did you say? What are the things that you want to see? We need lighting. We need more landscaping. We need more uh, beautification where people want to come in. You know, you got signs, welcome to Evo. Welcome to East Tampa. You know, let's address this area. We always get the short end of the stick. I'm tired of it. I want us to be able to to come in our areas of business and, and enjoy and look at beauty, mm -hmm. you know? So stop just giving us bones. We don't want okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Hey, Chad. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks. Good. So you came today uh, here to Andrew Blythe Library to do what? What was your What was your intent? Uh, to ask questions to FDOT about the 275 project. Uh huh. And what kind of questions did you ask, and were you satisfied with the answer? What What was one of your main concerns? Uh, main concern was uh, sidewalks around Telfair, which I guess falls under the city instead of FDOT. And then my next uh, concern was the noise, or sorry, sound walls and uh, the noise level of construction. The noise level of construction. And, and what, is, what, is, what are they saying to you? Uh, they're saying that the piling and noise will be done during the day mm -hmm. rather than night. Um, there should be no more of that. I believe they used it further south near Florida, Nebraska, but there is no um, piling going on at night at uh, Hillsboro and 275. Well, thank you very much, Chad. Thank you for your interview. And, uh, no, thank uh, you. So now I'm looking at the exit of 275. There's nothing really to protect me from cars, and there's no sidewalk. And I have mail with me, 
and we usually go to different places, but this is a little bit scary. Um, so we're gonna take it real slow, and who knows, we may actually go a different direction because cars from here come barreling through and they don't have any. Like I said, what you can see is that one has to walk on the street in order to go to the park, or in this case, it may, maybe just to go home. Another question is, who is going to repave this road, Elmore, after all the construction trucks and stuff drive through? This is the intersection of I-275 and Fletcher, and as you can see, this is the half wall sloping. Obviously, FDOT can't take care of it. What are we going to say about Osborne and Chelsea and Florabraska? My favorite little bump just before Florabraska Avenue. Supposedly, if this little bump goes away, then we won't have this terrible backup on the overpass going to I-4. So it's 275 South going to I-4. But look, another bump. And here we are, look, another, a lot of stupid people trying, trying to get on there, somebody else trying to get on. Now let's see how backed up it really is. Look at that. To go a little bit further. I see you came out to the East Ham. Thank you, Mr. Rosas, very much. All right, our next speaker is Michael Marino. Uh, good evening, board members. I'm Michael Marino. I'm the executive director of the Western Alliance. I provide a letter to you, but I want to highlight a few things. First of all, um, I think what is different about uh, what you are presented today with the tip Obviously, we want it to be approved as presented, but in that top 10, that Vision Zero list, there's actually two projects in West Shore. Uh, the first of which is a traffic signal at Boy Scout in Manhattan. That actually came from the West Shore Alliance Transportation Action Plan, and we actually heard it from the neighborhood, Lincoln Gardens, Carver City. They identified that as an issue back in 2018. You have those schools there at Roland Park and Jefferson. It's right next to a fire station. Uh, a few years ago, the TPO staff and city actually took that project and put it into the tip so it's already been in there. And then FDOT is now looking at it as a traffic signal. So that's an example of how the tip operates and has been successful. The other project on there, number 10, uh, is Lois Avenue, uh, which is a complete streets project. And I want to highlight complete streets because there's actually three complete streets projects in your tip tonight that are in the West Shore District. West Shore Boulevard, which has been a priority for the Alliance going back about 40 years, Spruce Street, and Lois. Complete streets, the value of complete streets is that they address Vision Zero policies, but they're also beneficial to economic development. So that's one of those projects that you all can do and take on that meets two of the major needs of the TPO. Um, and then I also want to talk about the uh, Gray Street Bicycle Boulevard, which is uh, on your project list tonight. We heard earlier the Dale Mabry pedestrian overpass is going to be built as part of the West Shore Interchange. There's also going to be three lanes underneath, or three new roads underneath the West Shore Interchange, Rio, Oxa, and Trask. So you have a real potential to have a pedestrian-friendly neighborhood where one currently doesn't exist. But there's a gap in the system. You could be on the Riverwalk, you could be on the great trails that are going to be built on the Howard Franklin Bridge and already exist on the Courtney Campbell Causeway, but the gap is Gray Street. You could take Gray Street from West Shore Plaza into West Tampa to Cash Street as a, on, right now on a bicycle. It's not the safest route, but there's already elements there. So it's a really cost-effective way to get that pedestrian connection, get the east-west connection, and be able to get it done before 2030 when the pedestrian bridge at Dale Mabry is done. So again, I appreciate your time, and uh, I encourage you to pass the tip as presented. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Matthew Suarez. Matthew Suarez did not sign into the meeting. Candace Lane Savitz. Okay. It's your turn. Thank you. I'm Candace Lane Savitz. I'm a homeowner in Tampa Heights. I am again speaking up about the FDOT 275 project. This project is toxic and it's hurting the residents of Tampa Heights, Seminole Heights, and Ybor Heights. I am calling upon our leaders to listen to the residents of this community. Please hear us. Commissioner Mariella Smith, respectfully, I call upon you to investigate my findings. As chair of the EPC, this is in your wheelhouse. I have, re I have an environmental lab report and would like your attention on this. I have reported an environmental concern at the EPC website. Please take a look. Commissioner Pat Kemp, respectfully, I call upon you to investigate my findings. As a resident, you are a resident of Seminole Heights community. I know you must be concerned about the toxic construction project that is just 100 yards from our Seminole Heights library and the surrounding schools. Our children need to be protected. We need you, Pat. Commissioner Gwen Myers, I respectfully call upon you to investigate my findings. Please take a ride with me and I will show you the re exposed rebar tour where you will see toxic concrete dust that was jackhammered into the air and into the lungs of your constituents in violation of the Clean Air Act. You need to know this. The Clean Air Act of 1970 was passed to ensure that our citizens may breathe freely and not get sick from man-made environmental pollutants. Subsequent amendments to the Clean Air Act allowed for particular protection of communities, low-income communities of color, because the past violators of the Clean Air Act had shown that they targeted these low-income communities to openly pollute, and they, they thought they could get away with it. Tampa Heights, in particularly Robles Park neighborhood, is precisely one of these communities that has federal protection, the, the status. The Lake Avenue and 275 underpass was ground zero for the FDOT toxic construction path through our historic communities. The shoddy and unsafe construction practices has caused toxic concrete dust and toxic natural silica dust, two different kind of toxic stuff went on, to poison these people. There is also toxic lead in this dust. And please, I don't want to hear about dust mitigation procedures that should have been followed. I never saw any of them. I've taken 100 photographs and made it my mission on this construction project on a regular basis. And my concerns are overwhelming me. I am reminded of the serious consequences that occurred at Gopher Resources. Toxic dust harmed people, killed people, made them sick. This is now a class action lawsuit as a result. It is the eventuality of the FDOT project. Is that what we're? Ma'am, thank you. Thank you very much okay. for your speech. And, and I have let a me lab report too. Thank you. And, and let me remind our speakers that we really we ask that you not identify specific board members and that you direct your comments to all the board members. So thank you very much, um, Shane Ragiel. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening, TPO board. Uh, thank you, staff, for assembling this robust document. My name is Shane Ragel. Um, I'm at 507 East 4 Nebraska Avenue out of Tampa Heights. I speak to you only as a resident of my community. I have no financial or professional benefit from the investments made in this document but beyond that of a homeowner. Uh, this is my fifth year speaking to you during this TIP process as I bought my home five years ago. And I hope that this will be the year that so many of you hold up the promises to make transit a priority ahead of what we've been doing in the past years. In the county, specifically in Tampa, uh, we're seeing it transform rapidly. The cost of living has never been higher. Our population is growing at a breakneck pace. And every day, we're on the brink of the decisions that are being made. We need a transformative decisions to be made, and the only way we're going to do that is to pass a tip that looks nothing like one that we've done before. My question in reviewing this year's tip is Hillsborough County looks nothing like it did five years ago. Why does the tip prioritize the same things? Why are the allocations the same? 
why are we still making the same decisions that have made our roads even more dangerous in the most recent years? We cannot build enough roads to keep up with the pace of the population growth in one of America's fastest growing cities. We need to get local traffic off of our roads and have mass transit options so that cars are optional and that interstate is used for long distance travel. When you are in traffic, you are the traffic. First, we need to abandon the approach of leaving things in the tip until DOT can better define them. Time and time again, we have seen that their priorities are to car and not to that of the transit planning organization that wants to have mass transit. Unless dollars can be clearly defined, their ambiguity uh, uh, with a billion dollar project cannot be assumed. Express lanes, wall movement, capacity have all been things that we have found out have a different meaning to different groups of people. FDOT can always come back and amend the tip when they have a better definition. For example, the opposition of expressed and told lanes through the city of Tampa. Uh, the DOT has yet to define what the express lanes mean and has left the door open for them to be told at some point, even though it's been the position of the city, the county, and the TPO has stand in opposition. Additionally, I'm against any projects that stand to add capacity to the highways, allowing for more cars to use the interstate through our urban core and impacting historic neighborhoods. Wall movement, adding lanes, increasing capacity, all just lead to more cars and a waste of our money. The interstate is a lemon, and we're not only burning money, but we're also sacrificing the urban core as a result. Imagine if even a slice of this budget went to heart or a dedicated bus lane throughout the city and the county. Highway expansion only stands to subsidize neighboring counties' population growth and encouraging urban sprawl at the expense of Tampa's urban core, leading to the need for even further expansion. Please stand in opposition to these things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Humera Afzal. Okay, she didn't sign in. Will Greaves. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman and members of the board. Um, thank you for your service. My name is Will Greaves. I'm a lifetime City of Tampa resident, business owner, and homeowner here. I sit on the board of mul multiple local nonprofits, including WMNF Community Radio, Tampa Bay Crew Rugby Football Club, and the Irwin Tech Advisory Board for its construction school. I tell you all that to demonstrate how committed to and passionate I am about my hometown and how engaged I am in this community. Um, in, no one I've ever talked to has ever asked for the widening of 275. I see it as a mandate from Tallahassee. What t residents of this city and county have asked for multiple times is real transit options. This can be demonstrated by the AFT in 2018 with 280,000 votes. Um, and it could also be demonstrated by the push to get that back on the ballot here in 2022. It can be seen in the record ridership numbers for the streetcar and the ferry, and both of those projects are expanding. The solution to our rapidly growing population in this region is a complex one and one that is fundamental to, to our city on the rise. The last thing we need is a decades long ham fisted project jammed down our throats that will further destroy and divide our beautiful historic communities, make traffic worse during the construction, and after all that be in inadequate when complete. We need to break the cycle. Solving this problem needs creative ideas and leadership from local sources, not some decree from Tallahassee. Let's put our resources where the people of this great city want them and let's make sure, um, and let's invest in a more equitable and sustainable future for all of our residents, not just those with cars. I see the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sharon Graham. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Thank you, Chairman and members of the TPO. My name is Sharon Graham Barrett, and I am a resident and own a private healthcare practice in Tampa. Widening highways, as many of you already know, is a racist policy that has been perpetuated from the Jim Crow era, and research has shown it to be ineffective in solving our transportation and traffic concerns. Please leave this policy in the past. We must invest in community-focused, 
public and active transportation infrastructure. That is what we need and want for an equitable and sustainable future. Putting this money primarily toward improvements in walking and biking paths means decreased rates of asthma, cancer, heart disease, and decreased rates of obesity and diabetes from more accessible and sustainable alternatives. The FDOT has published plans to widen I-275 and I-4 up to 50 additional feet into our historic neighborhoods. However, you, the TPO, have the power to stop this. We are asking you to stop further interstate intrusion in Tampa Heights, VM Ybor, Ybor City, Old Seminole Heights, and Seminole Heights specifically. We want the TPO to remove all funding for highway expansion from the annual transportation budget. Please remove it all. Replace it with funding for sidewalks, bike lanes, and improved bus line infrastructure and mass transit. In 2020, this board wrote a resolution supporting racial justice, which acknowledges, quote, whereas locally neighborhood clearing was manifested in the construction of I-275 and I-4, which were used to divide African-American communities and eliminate the Central Avenue Business District, end quote. We are watching for who really means those words. You will show it with your actions. Please vote in line with the letter and spirit of your resolution. Further highway expansion is a continuation of this discriminatory legacy. You must put your money where your mouth is. Do not continue to displace historically marginalized groups and further decrease their property values and health outcomes with increased noise and air pollution. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Aziza Afsal. I have Aziza Afsal in person. I don't see anyone coming up to the microphone. Uh, Brian Seal. Brian Seal did not sign into the meeting, Mr. Chair. Okay. Bobby Creighton. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, he did. You're right. Thank you. Um, Gloria Shepard. Gloria, go ahead, please. I'll mute your mic. Gloria, can you hear us? Mr. Chair, she's not responding. Okay. Uh, Cindy Davis. Cindy, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We yes, can. Go right ahead. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, TPO board and uh, council for taking time to listen to us. Uh, my name is Cindy Davis. I am a co-owner of uh, Pause Paradise for Life or a doggy daycare boarding facility on George Road. Um, my main concern uh, is that George Road Memorial um, Boulevard intersection and the portion that is in front of the 7-Eleven and my business uh, on the George Road portion. Um, we've been in that location for about two years, and we see an average of about one to two accidents a month, um, if not more on some occasions, uh, that results in bodily injury, uh, property damage, and just last week we witnessed a pedestrian actually be hit by a vehicle as he was trying to cross the road. Um, people are constantly parking on the sidewalk, uh, even though they know it's uh, illegal to park on a sidewalk, but because they're too lazy to pull into the parking lot at 7-Eleven to go to 7-Eleven, they park on the parking lot and this can cause huge safety problems um, with pedestrians that are walking along the sidewalk like they should be. Um, and I fear that we're gonna run into a situation where we're gonna have another pedestrian hit by a vehicle. 
Um, something has to be done about this particular intersection. We are constantly having fire truck, ambulance, injuries, accidents, tow trucks. It backs up traffic. It can cause more accidents because people don't care. They just keep driving through the accident. Um, but I have tried to contact several different individuals to try and get a safer uh, situation put up, at least just for the sidewalk, to be able to keep the pedestrians safe. Um, but it's starting to get very ridiculous about how many uh, times we've had to call an ambulance or you know the cops to come out and deal with an accident. Um, the last straw was watching the pedestrian get hit by a car. Um, and it was on our, our security feed and it's just, it's very traumatizing to watch this happen. Um, hopefully the gentleman did survive, but next time people won't be so lucky. And that is what I wanna see happen. We're a small little area and I feel like the small little areas get pushed to the back burner. I think this one needs to get pushed to the front burner. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much for that, Ms. Davis. Um, Dana Lazarus. Dana, can you hear us? Miss Lazarus, if you can hear us, sorry, please unmute. Sorry, I was muted. Thank yep. you. Sorry, there you it took go. me a sec. All right, thank you. So, good evening, everybody. Um, so, I'm not sure how your staff explains this process to you, but I've learned a lot about the TIP process ever since I first did before the board in 2016 to beg that they remove the TBX from the TIP, which it wasn't then and still hasn't been. But I just wanna recognize that you all, our TPO members, do not have the power to put projects into the TIP as only implementing agencies like the City of Tampa, FDOT, Hillsborough County, and Hart can do that. I get it. And I also get that when your community begs you for a change to fund public transit, to build protected bike lanes, et cetera, it must be frustrating because you can't do that directly. And we know that you wanna make a difference. Some of you have been saying you wanna make a difference for years now. And some of you for the past few months after hearing testimony about FDOT demolishing the beloved Lamar house and hearing that people had no idea that FDOT is about to blast the highway out to the additional feed. All of you want to make a difference and tonight you can. Your power is in inspiring a connected vision and coordinating it through those implementing agencies. More specifically, on tip night, your power is in taking things out of the tip and in prioritizing what is already there. Therefore, I am here to ask you for something realistic. I am here to ask you to remove funding for projects that widen the roads and highways flashing through our communities. Your staff has done their best to put together a plan based on the requests from those implementing agencies. Sorry, I lost my place, one sec. <clears throat> Great staff, by the way, I've worked with them. Um, and so they've done their best to uh, put together this tip based on those requests and the funding sources available. That's their job. Again, your job when it is tip time is to remove items from the tip and to prioritize the projects that fall in line with what the community wants, including public transportation, protected bike lanes, wide sidewalks, shared use paths, safety infrastructure, like that woman was just talking about, complete streets, connected transit routes, green spines, and more. You can tell FDOT no, and in fact, you're the only ones who can. You can ask your staff to work on joint agreements with FDOT so that they spend our money the way we need them to. Furthermore, there are competitive federal public transportation, transit-oriented development, and green infrastructure grants available and in the pipeline to be available soon, so please, do not fund any more expansion of pavement for cars because you think that's the only money there is or ever will be. In sum, please remove all funding for road widening projects, often called capacity projects, and highway expansion from the tip, and prioritize public and active transportation projects for federal funding. I guess, in other words, I'm still asking, please stop the TBX. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lazarus. Um, I, I'm gonna double back to Gloria Shepard. I believe Ms. Shepard is on the line. Ms. Shepard, can you hear us? Ms. Shepard, if you can hear us, please unmute your phone. All right, well, we're gonna move on uh, to Zulima Ramos.
Good Ms. evening. Sprinkle? Can y'all hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you for facilitating today's meeting. I've been living in Tampa for 15 years and run a local nonprofit. Um, I'm here to say that the state of public transit and gentrification, including the TIP, is dire for many of us living in this city. Immediate free 24 hour access and real safety measures can mean the difference between making it to a hospital and dying on the street. While volunteering with many different organizations in downtown Tampa, I've witnessed a dead man lying in a bush because he couldn't afford the debt that comes with calling 911 and there wasn't a bus or tram available to get to help. As a disabled college student at the University of Tampa, I remember the day when I was stuck alone in the city because a class or work schedule made me late for the last bus headed for an old home in Loop. Many jobs require work long past midnight. Human trafficking victims would also have a much better chance of getting away from their captors and transportation is a right that when honored can help the lives and features of the people you are supposed to work for. If public transit were free and expanded without the TVF, we would see less accidents and deaths, which include the loss of 30,000 people at least in this country and the maiming of many more every year in road crashes. If you all change the way we traveled and built structures in this county, there would be less air pollution and less criminalized acts of survival. Currently in this country, public transit use results in a reduction of 450 million gallons of gas being burned. If public transit were solar powered, imagine how much better our kids would be able to breathe. In addition, gas prices and rent are higher than they have ever been in my lifetime, while the pay at many establishments is staying the same. Families are having to choose what costs to cut, and this affects their ability to pay for the also increasing cost of childcare, food, housing, and other human rights. Well, at the same time, for every $10 million of transit investment made, business sales increased by $30 million. The solutions are there. Taxes wouldn't even have to increase. We could easily use the bloated police and sheriff's budget to transport hardworking folks all over this county and state for that matter, instead of displacing marginalized community members. We need transportation, not tasers. As silver TPO board members and staff ask the mayor of Tampa the city council, FDOT, and each other to support defunding prison slavery and things that do not work and refunding the community. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is just identified as Kat. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Um, as the person before me said, gas is the highest it's pretty much ever been. Um, it's like almost $5 a gallon. Um, I'm a teacher and I go between, depending on the time of year, I either sub or do full-time teaching. The average pay for subs is anywhere between eight and $12. Um, so I don't understand how we expect teachers to be able to afford to live, afford to feed themselves and afford to like drive and get to work. Um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, other cities around the country, poorer cities, such as Richmond, Virginia, and others, um, have free public transport where people can get on the bus for free and get around the city. Tampa is a much, much richer city, so I'm very confused why that isn't um, available here because buses are a public service and should be treated uh, like that for the residents here. The other day, I was on um, Dale Mabry Highway trying to bike downtown there were literally no sidewalks, and there was so much car exhaust in the air that I almost passed out and had a headache. Like, literally poison air. So I don't really understand what is going through your mind when you're telling people that you're going to, like, expand highways, destroying neighborhoods. Literally, no one, none of your citizens, none of the residents here want more highways. Everyone's asking for public transport, for child care, for basic necessities to be covered. So please get out of Fantasyland. Like, listen to the people that are trying to talk to you. Also, I understand that y'all have the power, um, y'all have the power of funds over the sheriffs. Sheriffs, as everyone here I think knows, are the ones that are evicting people in this city when they can't afford sir, rent. Sir, this is a bit far afield from, from, the, uh, from the tip. 
you all have the power to defund the sheriffs. And that's clearly incredibly important because sheriffs are evicting people and there's many Sir, houses people. Now, uh, this, the, the public comment needs to stay confined to the transportation improvement program. Um, so if you have additional comments on that, that's what we're taking right now. Yeah, y'all have influence over board members, influence over the mayor. So I please ask that you have a bit more of a conscience um, and try to like help actually help people in the city, whether it's with food deserts, whether it's for public transport or uh, ending evictions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Lena Young Green, uh, and I made a mistake earlier and gave Laron Barber's three minutes to Mauricio Roses. So, uh, Ms. Young Green, you have six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, uh, we are here one more year to ask you all to be considerate of us, the residents who are in the urban core, particularly us in Tampa Heights. Um, we thought that we had some changes when we were working with PBX, and then this year here, this year here we are again talking about walls that are extending and changing in our neighborhood, particularly in Tampa Heights. Um, we've been overburdened by transportation and interstates in Tampa Heights. We've talked about this so many times. Tampa Heights is one of the most impacted neighborhoods in the urban core by two interstates. Recently in the major environmental justice initiative that was announced about three weeks ago and the climate and economic justice map shows that how disadvantaged this area of our city is. In Tampa Heights around the interstate, that map that just came out three weeks ago shows that Tampa Heights has had a legacy of pollution, health burdens, particulate matter exposure, traffic proximity, and traffic volume. These are in a map that came out just three weeks ago identifying our area and the impact under in the, in, in environmental justice. As you know so well, that we share every opportunity that we get to tell you how we are wrapped around in the elbow of the interstate. On 275, going north and south along Tampa Heights Eastern Boundary, where it turns into the east-west travel along Tampa Heights again. We are right there in the elbow of the department of, oh, of the interstate. And then not far from that elbow is where 275 starts. In addition, about eight miles block, eight, about eight blocks west of the interstate, Florida and Tampa Street run north-south which are two of DOT's main pass-through streets. And then we are bounded on the north by State Road 574, which again is another high traffic area. You could see why we continue to have these, these areas that are so highly affected in our community. Today we are asking for this for the removal of the three items that were mentioned before several times, the westbound I-4, northbound 275, westbound I-4 to southbound to 275, and then the southbound 275, eastbound to 14th. Another request is that you move forward with the Heights Mobility Project, 
with its dedicated transit, transit lanes on Florida and Tampa Street, again, in Tampa Heights. I commend and thank you for including the green arteries. I feel personally affected by that as one of the neighborhood leaders who started the green artery and worked with 22 communities to be able to de develop the green artery. We know that better trails will reduce many vehic vehicular accidents in our area. The green artery will, will provide a loop around Tampa for walking and biking, and it will help with Vision Zero, which I was honored to receive the award as one of the persons supporting Vision Zero. I'm asking that along Robles Park, which is directly across from my house, that uh, you not put a hard cement wall along the interstate there. We need plants. We need living tree walls behind the, the uh, Robles Park. We know that trees will improve the quality of the, the air in an exact area where we have that same concentration and legacy of bad quality air that I just referenced above. Uh, we need to, we're asking about the moving, no. In addition, uh, we're asking uh, that we get sidewalks along Telefaro. And that M also- Ms. Young-Green, uh, your six minutes are up. Thank you very much. Uh, Harrison Lundy. Harrison did not sign into the meeting. All right, and then we have two additional uh, in-person speakers still left, David Coleman. And after that will be Kevin O'Hare. today um, crash density thank you and thanks for your report and I was told before the meeting that um, that um, <clears throat> there were positive things going to be done for, for safety um, but I'm going to I'm still going to read my my thing here um, my name is Dave Coleman and <clears throat> good, ev good evening commissioners my name is Dave Coleman and um, I've been a resident here for 22 years. The governor has said that it is not the United States of county commissioners or school boards. He wants you silent. 255 deaths from traffic with 7,300 hit and runs last year in Hillsborough alone. Gun violence is a terrible thing, mo needlessly taking lives, and we all want something done. I feel the same about traffic deaths. Would each of you jot down the speed limit on 275 from Bush Boulevard all the way to the Hank Howard Franklin Bridge? Um, at a recent um, Coffee with Castor <clears throat> event, her traffic guy got it wrong. Because <clears throat> there are few signs and zero enforcement. Three years ago, in two days, three teenagers were killed on North Florida Avenue, won by a cop doing 66 miles an hour in an unlit residential area. I began to attend FDOT meetings. I got responses that were completely inadequate as to why nothing was done to cut the deaths in our county. Signs won't help, they said. Um, we, have re we have to redesign the roads. Lower limits won't work. We don't have enough enforcement. They spent <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of dollars to a Mi Miami company on a landscape project at the apex in front of Avala with a flashing crosswalk because Tallahassee told them to, unneeded and unasked for. 255 deaths in Hillsborough County, 7,300 hit and runs. I have to believe my fellow citizens are so sick of this as well that if they knew of Tallahassee's disregard and the inability of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office on enforcement, they would want to step up. Adding a few minutes to our drive time, lowering and obeying speed limits on secondary roads, I know the argument that we need to redesign the roads, but 35 Arrive Alive campaign on secondary roads would stop the slaughter now. 
Black spot area, black spot signs are um, <clears throat> wherever a person is killed. It's called a black spot accident area. It's used in other places. You see a, a white sign with a big black circle. Somebody's died there. Um, we could, could we could move the community to action. You can. You're our electeds. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> I'm I'm, I'm going to make it. I am. Increased penalties for leaving the scene of an accident or hitting a pedestrian. With 1.3 cops for every 1,000 residents in, in Hillsborough, I believe people could or would step up. 255 deaths, 7,300 hit and runs. Tallahassee and their oligarchs want you silent. I say this is the United States of county commissioners and school boards, and you have the power to change things. Thanks. The speed limit Thank on you, 275 in the city limit is 55 Thank you very miles much. an hour. Thank it's you. It's the best kept secret in Tampa. Thank you. Well, hopefully more people know it now. Uh, our last speaker tonight uh, in public comment uh, is Kevin O'Hare, and he's here in person. Hi, everyone. Hi. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin O'Hare. I live over in the West Shore. Uh, neighborhood and I currently work in Ybor City. I'm speaking today in regards to a few items on the 2022-2023 tip for your consideration, which first is to strike the three additional lane movements from the DTI quick fix project labeled in the tip table one. Additionally, uh, please support additional funding for the green artery segments for both D and E and continue funding on the Heights Mobility Study and support for the Ardeal uh, Bus Rapid Transit Project, not on the highway to encourage urban core transportation and reduce traffic. When I first attended uh, my first TPO, then MPO tip hearing in 2015, uh, FDOT came and presented uh, the first iteration of what was then the Tampa Bay Express project and citizens spent the next couple of years coming to this exact meeting in droves to denounce the project and FDOT eventually pulled back and rebranded and came back uh, to the tip uh, every single year afterwards. And uh, every year we're continuously told from the department that uh, we want to uh, put forward options uh, for investment that the community asked for. In 2018, Hillsborough County residents voted in an overwhelming number explicitly on a referendum that prevented uh, no further funding for interstate expansion. People have spoken and they'll speak again in 2022 and the majority of the choir tonight is singing all from the same hymn book, no more interstate expansion. Every new lane on an interstate is another in the wrong direction. Please remove the additional lanes from the DTI quick fix project and put a quick end to interstate expansion on the urban core. It's time to get to work on a diverse set of options to move around Hillsborough County. Please remove the DTI quick fix from the tip. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes the public comment portion of our meeting tonight. And we are gonna move on now to Davida Franklin who is going to come back and give us the summary of public comments on the, on the tip that were submitted in advance of tonight's meeting. Hello again, I'm Davida Franklin, and here is your summary of tip public comments. So these comments were received through Facebook, Twitter, and email, and one was received uh, uh, via phone. So opposing the South County ferry, pro uh, ferry project are Randy Lee and Jim Jennings. They say it only serves commuters to MacDill Air Force Base, and so they do disagree with that project. Uh, we have some folks who support the Heights Mobility Project, Andy Mikulski, Christopher Martinez, uh, Brian Turnbull, and then also you've heard uh, from earlier, Rick Fernandez, the Vice Chair of the Citizens Advisory Committee, um, and as well as Tim Keyport, the president of the Old Seminole Heights Neighborhood Association, Naya Young, who is the executive director of the Tampa Heights Junior Civic Association, Jessica Charles, and Kitty Wallace. So they all support the, uh, the Tampa Heights Mobility Project. We also have a few folks who oppose the downtown interchange and widening of I-275. Those are Cynthia, Cynthia uh, Peters, Cameron Hunt McNabb, Elizabeth Corwin, Ute Dequemin, Nicole Perry and Matt Perry. Rick Fernandez, Tim Keyports, Naya Young, Jessica Charles and Kitty Wallace also recommend to strike the three DTI or downtown interchange lane movements in table one, which you, again, you've heard some of those from earlier. Um, and also we have Christopher Martinez who uh, supports that strike as well. 
Rick Fernandez and Tim Keyports and Lena Young also wrote in about the uh, reconstruction of the I-275 overpasses to fully vertical walls on Floribraska, Chelsea, and Osborne. And um, I'll just say again that that group also uh, wrote in for some other um, concerns as well. So they did support funding for the green artery segment, segments D and E and to stop the intrusion of retention walls in Tampa Heights. But we also have Christopher Martinez and T Tim Keyports and Brian Turnbull who also support funding the green artery trail segments D and E. And we also have um, we have Nicole Perry and Matt Perry who also wrote in about concerns with the retention walls in Tampa Heights. Magalise Oro, Katrina Duquemin, and Lauren Adrianson requested to stop widening the highway. Mauricio Rosas, you did again hear from him earlier about his concerns. He also wrote in about concerns regarding the lack of funding for segments D and E of the Green Artery Trail. Ing Hildreth, Hildreth has concerns that the 2200 block of East Fern has not been paved in 30 years. And also Mac McWhorter suggests adding a signal with a red green arrow to the right turn lane at North Parsons Avenue and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard to increase safety and de decrease lane movements. Howard Harris requests uh, better synchronization of traffic lights on Columbus Drive going towards Florida Avenue to decrease commuter traffic travel time during rush hour. Wayne Olson has two requests for resurfacing uh, 109th Avenue between 15th and 22nd Streets and Bougainvillea between 22nd and Florida Avenue. Tim Keyports, again, he is the president of the Old Seminole Heights Neighborhood Association. He says, he says that uh, FDOT needs to complete capacity improvements from north of I-4 to north of US-92 with, with robust and appropriate landscaping to minimize noise pollution and to enhance the appearance. Also, move the highway BRT to the Veterans Express, Expressway to avoid further ex expansion of I-275. Support, build, and further expand the green spine. Add a sidewalk to the east side of I-275 along Talaferro Road to connect the Robles area of Tampa Heights to transportation op options and expanded employment options. Support Mayor Castor's priorities submitted to the TPO on Feb February 18, 2022, except the, uh, the section addressing the, T the DTI. And he also requests support, uh, I'm sorry, he also supports Rick Fernandez's um, recommendations. And, Rick's, and Rick Fernandez also, he wrote in saying that he supports his recommendations. Uh, Christina Gesmundo supports future funding for greenways, trails, walk and bike connections, as well as all the safety enhance, enhancements listed as considerations. Michael Marino, you did hear from him earlier, and he did express um, a request for support for the complete streets and safety projects of South Tampa, as well as uh, using Gray Street as a connector between Riverwalk and the Courtney Campbell and Howard Franklin trails. Stephen Hayes requests safety improvements to the following locations, MacDill and Neptune due to multiple accidents and losses, MacDill between Palmacia due to excessive speeding, and he also is supported by Cheryl Dillon, who suggests that sidewalk safety improvements be made to MacDill. Zalima Ramos suggests public transportation that is efficient and free. And Christy Hess opposes any expansion of the green artery that puts bicyclists on the roads designed and meant for motor powered vehicles, regardless of painted lanes. So those are the comments that you did receive in advance. And please note that these are in the attachments that you received earlier from Cheryl Wilkinen, although there were a couple of comments that did come in uh, much later today. And um, also Mauricio Rosas, he shared a, vi a video earlier that was distribu distributed to all of you as well. Uh, many thanks to everyone who commented and this concludes my report, thank you. Thank you very much for all of that. All right, we are at the point in the meeting where we are going to take up the tip and uh, at this time, we will open for board comments or questions. Councilman Maniscalco, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you for running such a great meeting. We appreciate it. Uh, and I thank all the uh, community uh, leaders and members that came out to speak. This is my eighth uh, TPO 
I'm sorry, TP, it used to be MPO, now TPO, but a tip meaning. And uh, I think I'm one of the longest serving people here with the exception of a, of a few that have been here since day one. Um, I have never uh, been a supporter or proponent of widening the interstates. Um, I think everything has been said. Uh, you know, racist policies or not. Look at the destruction that the interstate has done to this community. I can talk about history. I love Tampa history. Uh, and I look at, as I study that, um, I see the destruction that it has caused in the past and the, um, the destruction that it will continue doing as we further expand to accommodate automobiles without accommodating the neighborhoods and the people and the pedestrian. So in looking at the uh, list of priority projects here. There are a lot of wonderful things. I went through it multiple times looking at items that are uh, very beneficial and needed. Florida Avenue, Martin Luther King to Waters. Habana from Martin Luther King to Hillsborough. I'm, I'm in that neighborhood there. Azeal from Dale maybe to Armenia. These are places that I drive every day. Martin Luther King Urban Corridor Improvements. I'm there every day. McDill, Beta Beta Kennedy. There are a lot of great things. Um, Dale Mabry at Spruce, my mother complains about that every day. The Green Artery segment, uh, E and D, um, we talk about the, the importance there. Um, but then we look at the West Shore Interchange, which I understand, um, you know, the, the, the congestion and the, the necessity, but I see here with general purpose and express lanes, including new express lanes. Again, I don't believe in Express lanes, I don't believe in widening the interstate and continuing to take up right away. Um, noise walls from Hillsborough Avenue to Bears along 275 and what that's doing. And then I finish up with the Crossberry service and a lot of other items that I deem very important. But at the same time, you know, we heard from Mr. Fernandez, we heard from other people in the community regarding uh, the downtown interchange, regarding um, I-4 to, to 275 North, uh, westbound I-4 to, to 275 South, southbound I-275 and eastbound I-4. I can't and I, I don't support the TIP projects because of items in here, some that are already funded, um, but uh, I, I couldn't vote for this uh, and vote against the community and everything that's been said because there are items in here that are already funded that I don't think can be taken out. I don't think if, if, if there's a, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, if I were to make a motion, and I'll wrap up with this, to remove items from table one, is that even possible since they have already been, they're already in there and funded from the past? Mr. Clark, maybe you could speak to that. So, uh, board members, it, whether or not something can be removed from the tip has not so much to do with whether it's in a previous tip, it's the, the stage that it's at, the stage of development that it's at. And as I've, I've read to the board before, the relevant provision of the statute states that projects including the tip uh, and that have advanced to the design stage of preliminary engineering may be removed or uh, from or rescheduled in a subsequent tip uh, only by joint action of the MPO and the department. Um, there's a second sentence in that provision that's not related to what you're asking, but the um, statute doesn't define, now the key term to me in that provision is uh, design stage or preliminary engineering. The statute doesn't define that, it's not a legal term. Um, I read that really as a sort of a construction term of art. That's a, I've heard the term, read the term many times doing, uh, reading construction documents and things of that nature, but the MPO, I'm sorry, the TPO staff doesn't work on the projects. They don't track what stage the project's at. So it really is up to uh, how, where different projects that are already in the TIP, what stage development they're at, is really uh, something that the department would uh, be best qualified to speak to rather than, because it's not a legal question per se. There's no case law on this statute that speaks of this issue, no attorney general opinions. The guidance on this is none from a legal standpoint. Uh, so uh, that being said, the answer to the question is, it's not the fact that something's been in the tip in the past that makes it so it can't be removed. It's what stage of development's at within the tip. Thank you. Is, is that all for the moment? Yeah, that's it for now. Thank you. Sir.
Okay, I have uh, Commissioner Overman and then Mayor Ross. Okay, um, I had a similar question. Um, Mr. Wong earlier today made a comment regarding the table two that has the column of no return. So I think it's in, in relationship to Councilman Maniscalco's question. Could you further define what that column truly, I, I, maybe I just missed it. I was, I was like, wait, what did you just say? <laughs> so could you clarify what that no return column means that is only on table two? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Commissioner. So we included that column to present uh, board members before it's too late to let them know at what stage of the process each project has, has, uh, uh, is at. We rely on the agencies that are developing the projects to tell us, though we don't necessarily perform like a cross-reference or a check on that. So if any of the local governments submit a project to us and they tell us if we give them funding, it will be for design, <clears throat> I would treat that as if um, it has crossed the point of no return according to uh, Cameron thinks that um, when it's in the design phase of preliminary engineering, that would be too late to remove it. So um, long story short, for any project that has been reported to us to be design phase, design and construction, or construction, we put a yes in that column. Some of the other projects that uh, may not have a design stage, like um, if you flip to page one of the table, you see a lot of transit projects. Those don't follow the same project development stages that a construction project would. Bus replacements, for example, no construction, but if you award that money this year, there's, no real, there's really no way to take it back. Like once the buses are purchased, we're not gonna return them. You know what I mean? So um, that's why we included yes in that column for those types of projects. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. And I, and I think it clarifies something that we've, we've been wrestling with for quite some time. So on, on table, there are, I just want to, I do want to say, there are a lot of amazing projects on this tip. There are, really are. Um, all of our partners have done an excellent job of highlighting areas that where we can make a significant difference in partnership, you know, with the resources we have, with the federal dollars that are available, as well as our partnership with the state. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm quite impressed with the, the heftness I would say of the Vision Zero effort in this particular phase, and in, in not only are they addressing you know improvements of our transportation system, but it's also focused on making sure that we're addressing Vision Zero in an effort to reduce some of the crashes and some of the pedestrian and cyclist deaths and and you know auto drivers deaths mm -hmm. that we're seeing in our community that are just literally off the charts and not appropriate at all. However, what I do find is that the comparison between table one and table two um, sort of answers the, what I'm wrestling with. Uh, as we've heard earlier, the, the projects on page 55, 57, and 58, um, which are the uh, 4450561, 4450562, if I'm getting these numbers right, and then 4450571, which are the expansion of 275 uh, to and from I-4 downtown interchange in the northbound, westbound, no, I'm sorry, westbound I-4 to northbound 275, westbound I-4 to southbound 275, and southbound I-275 to eastbound I-4 are all considered to, in the design build stage for this year. Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. But when I look over at table two, that does have your no return column. Um, so we are in 22, correct? But we're planning for 23, 24? Currently 21, 22. Uh, through 20 yes. for the next five years, right? Yes. So when I look over at table two, and I look at the correlating project pages, because the actual c codes, FPN numbers are not on table two. Mm -hmm. Um, but it does references to the pages, and it does show a 22 priority list. It relates to page 11, where it lists the major projects under uh, 
2022 priority list as 60, number 67. And it does show no return is being yes. So in the no return column. Yes. So does that mean that this board does not have the legal right to actually reject that item on table one and or table two? I'm gonna tap Cameron in a second to expand on this, but it's our understanding that um, West Shore Interchange reconstruction is con uh, constitutes one major oh, project. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to West Shore. I apologize. I apologize. Um, I was actually referencing, they're also on 57 and 58, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, referencing the, um, your tables are a pain. Is it um, the noise walls? No, I, I'm, I'm actually not really opposed to the noise walls per se, uh, especially if we're able to actually get robles protected when it should have been protected to begin with. But um, I think that was a part of the project. I guess it's on table one, that, mm -hmm. which is not that part of that project is, is only on table one that illustrates the operational safety improvements as being design bill of fiscal year 22 on table one. So if, if, let me rephrase the question. Uh, given that it was on a 22 priority list, mm -hmm. and given it shows design build, however, it is not referenced on table two, is, um, is it this board's ability to advise on whether or not the projects that are listed on table one as major projects listed on page 55 and 57, 58, that relate to the downtown interchange. So are we able to say no or, with, or pull that from table one at this um, stage? It's, so my understanding is that with the TIP amendment in October of last year, um, the funding to complete that project was allocated. So um, with it being design build stage in this year, um, I do believe that it would have crossed the point of no return. I'm gonna tap Cameron to confirm or deny I do believe that it now, I'm is just looking for a yes or no. I think yes. Yes, we are able or we are uh, not we are prohibited so, from sorry. pulling it. No, I think it is I think it is advanced past the stage at which uh, the TPO board can remove it from the tip. From if, this if, current if, if tip. the board's desire to remove it, it would be a joint action. Okay, yeah, understood. Just, I'm just okay, answering yeah. the question of which our constituencies yeah. have asked us to consider and I realize that there are some questions here. And I realize this board is in a, a little bit of a tough, a little bit of a tough spot. Looking for an answer, what we're legally able to do, and what we're permitted to do in joint action with FDOT at this point. So the way that, that design is defined is when it, once it gets past the um, the approval of the PD&E, more or less. When we approve the PD&E findings, when we do environmental clearance on it. Then if you approve the stage to go to design, then that's when design starts. Um, in this case, we're, this, this will be awarded to a contractor within two weeks. So it's already been out for bid for eight months now. Um, they've been working on their plans and proposals. So um, it's certainly well beyond the design phase. Um, it's in this fiscal year, which ends obviously in three weeks, four, three, four weeks. So by the end of this fiscal year, the contracts will be awarded to contractors. So in other words, we're not permitted to pull it, but we do still have as a board some guidance or opportunity to impact what that design looks like, given that the design has not yet been done? No, the design, well, yes and no. We will work with the design build contractor. However, they're gonna submit a bid based on our concept plans. And we did put a lot of restrictions in there of what they could and couldn't do to vary. For instance, they can't make the walls go out further than we showed in the concept plans, things like that. We can work with them to refine it somewhat, and we will. And there's been some things we've talked to the community about. For instance, some of the uh, treatments along the walls with brick pavers as opposed to a, a more of a shell pattern. Um, some other things that we can amend the contract to include. So we have some flexibility in there. Of course, it comes with a cost. They're not gonna do it for free. So we have some latitude in there, but um, it all depends on, we haven't seen their proposals yet. Um, whoever wins the bid in a few weeks, then we'll know what their proposal is, which should be pretty close to what was in the concept plans 
but if there was any major variances from it, um, they'd have to stay within the restrictions that we set. I, I mean, the reason I asked these questions specifically about design and, and aesthetics and was because what you heard from the community that is feeling the pain of having their dis communities destroyed historically and still living with that, but also the disconnect between the neighborhoods as a consequence of the any changes along the interstate. You know, we want to see that there's an opportunity for connecting those communities rather than further taking them apart. And you and I have had the conversation about what we think about the underpasses that are currently under construction that are not meeting the neighborhood's expectations. So that's why I asked the question about design. Yep. At one point, should this be legally unable to pull it? What part of this TPO's role is there in being able to aesthetically and environmentally um, be able to impact what we end up with as an outcome in order to meet the needs of the community that is being impacted by the widening of this interstate? Right. So I think there's a number of things. So as some of you probably know, we have done some recent community meetings, uh, met with folks in the Tampa Heights community, We've met with folks in East Tampa, trying to get a better idea of some of the things that they wanted to see. Um, and and I'll, I'll tell you, our team's been working hard trying to find ways to improve what we've got. Um, some good things, good news. Um, one is um, we were able to find a way to build the noise wall through the Robo Parks area, so we're able to add that now. Um, it was a way that we hadn't seen been used before, but we found it, and FHWA said, okay, it doesn't work many places. You pretty much have to have almost everywhere with a noise wall and a little piece without, and they let you kind of kind of cost average it somehow. It worked, so we're going to build that. At the underpasses, and you should have been provided in your packets today some, some visuals, um, what we did on that was, and, and I'll say that maybe we, um, we misinterpreted some of the input we received earlier. We really thought that uh, what, what was requested was better lit and wider sidewalks through the underpasses to make them wider and, and better lit for security. And so um, typically on our underpasses, we've been providing five, 10 foot sidewalks like you see in most places. So what we did was at Hillsboro and at MLK, we actually pushed it as far as we could. And I believe it's about 40 plus feet wow. that's underneath there. At the other three, we made them 15 feet wide sidewalks. And what this did was it created a vertical wall that went up about five feet, and then atop of that was a slope wall, and on top of the vertical wall was a fence. Um, when we went back to the community, what we heard was, well, what we really wanted was we didn't want to have trash in that fenced area. We didn't really want to see homeless people camped out in those underpass areas, um, and we'd like to have the opportunity to put some sort of art or, or a mural or something under it to make it look more attractive. So our folks went back to the drawing board to say, okay, what can we do to try to make this um, better? On the, on the current project, this wouldn't be something we'd come down the road and do later, we'll build it into this project. And our plan is to go back to the community with some of these ideas and show it to them to get better input. Um, and uh, some of the ideas we have, one is sort of like you see at the river walk where you can, we can actually get the wall up to about eight foot tall. So it's above your head level, so if you're you know, walking through there, your eye level, you're, you're gonna see, you can put murals or stuff on there, and then put a fence all the way up to the bridge, tie it in so that you couldn't get in there. The only thing we'd have to have an access for is our bridge inspectors to go in there and inspect the bridge every two years like they have to. Another was to put up a metal screen that um, they're actually pretty attractive, and they can be put into any kind of patterns you want, pretty much. And they would do the same thing, would kind of box that area in. So we're gonna bring some of those ideas back. We also, um, at our community meeting, showed some concepts with the walls that maybe tied in better to the historical nature of the community, where in areas where we were gonna build a new wall, we would put in the brick pattern that makes it look more like a historical area, bricked area. And the areas where we have existing walls that we're going to be going in, we could put in a knee wall, called a knee wall. It's a brick wall that comes up a certain distance. And, and it looks really nice. Um, those are the kind of things. We're also working on some other things based on the input we received. So those are the kind of things we can also work with the contractor that gets awarded the uh, downtown interchange project to do it some of those underpasses. And although it's you know, still in construction, um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's obviously you can't see it taking place right now, 
But I think you'll find that once this is done with some of the partnerships we've had with the city of, of Tampa in terms of public art and some of the things we can do to enhance those areas, we're gonna put LED lighting up there from both directions so it's very bright and then you know people hopefully won't feel unsafe walking through there. I think it'll be much better than it is today. Um, so yeah, we, we can still have influence in there and we will. Um, it would be hard to completely redesign it because they bid on it, but um, we do have some ability to do that. And, and I do want to thank Commissioner Myers because she, she and I had a lot of conversations about the noise wall at Roval Park and she explained to me some of the thoughts of the community about that and uh, it made a lot of sense and so we were able to uh, find a way to do that. Excellent. That's it's amazing when we say, no, we don't want to do that. You guys do listen. Thank you very Sometimes much. Sometimes we find some stuff that we didn't know about. <laughs> no, I, I do appreciate that. Um, and I, you know, but I, I still have some qualms about whether or not we should move forward on, on this design build stage because there is still a great deal of uh, concerns about what we'll actually end up with, with the outcome. And I, so I'm, I'm willing to hear what the rest of the board decides to do with that. The only other thing I wanted to say is thank you um, for the work that's being done um, for the mobility project and for the transit projects in partnership with HART. Um, and thank you HART, you know, for the continued hard work to look for ways that we can actually increase the bus service, allow buses to get through, allow pedestrians and, tra and, and cars to get through, in order to make, create additional safety uh, along Florida and Tampa Street. Um, it's a key element for tra tra changing the transportation in that area. And the money was awarded through the RAISE grant, which I appreciate that, um, and, offered, and offered through um, DOT. Um, part of what is necessary is a dedicated bus lane for that project. And I noticed that you guys moved the project from I guess Hart's job over to a major economic category because it was addressing the issues associated with stormwater and drainage and, and other other categories for major economics. Can you can you um, can you help me understand whether or not that means that we will actually have the ability to offer a protected bus lane and you know, do you need, in order for us to fully take advantage of that raise grant and the planning, all the planning that's already been done? I mean, do you need, what do you need from us or what do you need from HART to be able to move forward on making sure that that, that type of technology or that kind of strategy for yeah. bus rapid transit to, through, to, ad to address the goals that have been established and and researched with the Heights Mobility Project. What do yeah. you need from either us or from Hart to be able well, to move forward on that? Well, so first, we don't we don't need anything, and um, it is unfortunate. There was some information that got out that um, was, I, I don't know if I'd call it completely incorrect, but I would call it very incomplete, and it wasn't fair to Hart. Um, Adley has been a great partner working with us, um, and uh, there had been some discussion about converting the lane to a bus only lane. Um, the biggest challenge we have in either building a streetcar extension or the bus rapid transit in that corridor is that you have to take care of the drainage problem. It won't meet ADA requirements. It won't meet any of the, you couldn't build it in that lane because it floods so much. And believe it or not, the, it's not like we just have to put a small pipe in the road. We have to put a 10 foot by six foot box underneath the road to be able to take care of all the drainage out there because it's just, it doesn't drain out there. And so that was really the biggest thing that sold us for the raise grant was the resiliency, was the ability to provide the drainage and the flooding relief. The transit was also in there. What we said is we're gonna build the road and have it set up for, um, for the bus rapid transit and for the streetcar extension. Um, on that project, uh, we got an $18 million grant from the federal government and um, we have uh, $27 million that FDOT contributed. That will set it up so you can put either the, the bus rapid transit or the, uh, the streetcar on that, those lanes. What we talked hard about was the way our process works, there has to be a sponsor for that bus lane because we're not a bus, we're not a, a, a transit provider. Hart would do that. Hart's currently going through the study to determine what type of premium service are you gonna provide out there. It's a study, so you, you, you can't just say, this is what we're gonna provide. It's like, we're doing a study, and at that point, we'll know what we're gonna provide. But we're convinced 
based on Talking Alley, is going to be a premium service of some type in that corridor. Mm -hmm. They'll submit the application, which they're working on now, and then we'll convert it. And I imagine by the time the project gets constructed, we'll just construct it as part of the project. It's more or less just striping and some signs is all it is. This lane is a bus only lane. We're committed to doing that. Hart's been a great partner. Um, there was a press article in the, in the business journal. Unfortunately, and I, and I talked to the writer and he was, you know, very, it was an innocent mistake, but I think he didn't listen to all of some of the CAC meeting and misunderstood some of the, 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 the processes we're following but it's just process. We're gonna make those bus only lanes. Adley and her group are gonna do a great job. They're gonna to put together the, the lane repurposing study and we're gonna put it in there as a bus lane. So it's a nothing to worry about. Excellent. It will happen. Well, that, that's what I wanted to hear. I just wanted to make sure it was true. <laughs> um, it was confusing. I mean, in terms of what I, what I read too, I, I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. And the last thing I wanna do is leave any money on the table. No, Especially no since table. we're in order for us to be able to do all the things, half of the things on the long-term plan yeah. is gonna require a surtax to have the matching dollars to be competitive for much of the projects that are on this list in the first place. No doubt, and we actually have, we still have $67 million sitting waiting for the local funds for the streetcar, so. <laughs> all right, great. Well, I appreciate your, your answer, and I'd, I'd love to hear the board discussion on what we do with the downtown interchange, so thank you. Thank you, all right. Well, we have three people in the queue right now. The first is Mayor Ross, and then Councilwoman Hurtak, and then Ms. Legrand has her hand up uh, virtually. So Mayor Ross, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, if I could get Dr. Wong to come to the podium, and if I could direct the board members' attention to table one, page two, the item I'm going to be discussing is the second to the last Vision Zero project involving Fowler Avenue. If you'll see that that project includes three sub-projects, and the one I'm asking about is the last of the three, 4496441. That is the phase two of that project, which is from 56th Street East to I-75. And so in looking at table one, um, it would appear that this whole Fowler Avenue renovation is funded. It's on table one. And that goes from 275 to 56th Street is in phase one, 56th Street to I-75 in phase two. And then I looked at table two and my excitement quickly got squashed because on page four of table two, you'll see on page four of table two that phase two that 449644 project that I mentioned, which is the 56th Street to I-75 portion that goes through my city, is priority number 20 on table two. So it is not funded. And I'm trying to get a better understanding of this because when I talk to DOT, they've been telling me for a couple of years and they tell me again today that they are committed to completing this project all the way from 275 to I-75. They, they tell me that they've always told me the same thing, that there's two phases of this, and the first phase is going to be the west section, which makes sense to me. I don't like it because I'd like my section done first, but, <laughs> but I understand the data supports doing the the west section through Tampa first because there's more crashes and more pedestrian. So that makes sense. I'm not crazy about it, but I understand the reasoning. But I'm very concerned and I don't understand, and I know we had some email correspondence, but I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have clarity on why, in fact, this, this project is on table three also. This, it, this project is broken up into so many pieces that it's on all three tables. So, I, and I don't need to understand the whole process of intricate financing. I just want the road built. And now I'm concerned that it's, my, I'm very concerned that they're going to build the part from 275 to 56th Street, and that the part from 56th Street to I-75 is then going to linger for years on table two as other priorities emerge. So can you, can you help me what, and I'm glad the Secretary Gwynn's here too, because I can't reconcile what I'm being told, and I don't. I need to understand. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm happy to clarify. Um, originally conceived the project 
covering the entire corridor from 275 to I-75. Can't speak to exactly why it was segmented in the way it was, but to answer your question about it falling off the radar or getting forgotten, um, I can assure you that that will not happen. Um, so the segment that runs from Temple Terrace 56 to I-75, there's a planning study already programmed um, to kick off in fiscal year 23, and then the TPO is recommending, uh, to, or TPO staff is recommending to the board to allocate $5 million for preliminary engineering um, based on the results of that study. So we're recommending that we set aside $5 million in 2027 to keep moving that segment forward. Well, see, that's the what I didn't want to hear because DOT wants to build the road in 27, mm -hmm. not design it in 27. Yes. And this is, so this is much different, and I have not been on the TPO as long as some of my colleagues, but since I've been on it, this is obviously a priority for Temple Terrace. And since I've been on it last year, it almost fell off the list completely due to a I don't even know, it was a clerical error, and thank goodness my colleagues here voted in favor of my motion to put it back on the table where it was supposed to have been, but this project seems to be slipping away from our city every year. And so can you, Justin, please help me to understand better? Sure, uh, Justin Hall with FDOT District 7. Hopefully I could return a little bit of excitement uh, for that project. Um, so the plan is to construct that in 27. Uh, those funds will be reflected in the tentative work program that gets presented to this board. I believe we're not in an accelerated cycle, so in December. Uh, so you'll see those funds for design and construction. Uh, those are funds that we set aside uh, just based on uh, federal allocation changes. So I'm sure everyone heard there was an increase in federal allocation. The TPO is going to benefit from that, but the DOT is also benefiting from that. It's about a 33.5% increase in federal allocation. Uh, so we do have that slated. Uh, it, it's It's been programmed as a candidate so it doesn't show until the cycle reopens which that happens in july july one uh, so it'll be reflected in the tentative work program so you will see the construction then and at that point i believe the tpo will move it to table one because that's generally what they what they do when they see it um, and honestly it could be moved to table one now uh, but the process generally is once the funds show up in the tentative work program then they move it over and did you say that would happen in december ish yes sir Yes, sir, and we generally come and present the tentative work program, DOT does. And so that'll be part of that presentation. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you, Thank you, right. Mayor. So, Mayor Ross, uh, it sounds like what you're asking us to do is um, change the note in project status request column from 5 million recommended for PE to design and construction in 27. Um, of course, taking effect when DOT presents the tentative work program later this year. So we can make that change for you. Well, if, if adding that language to that cell makes a meaningful difference, by all means, let's do it. But, well, um, well, it memorializes what you talked about tonight, so that I would yeah. do it. <laughs> no, we won't forget about it. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, Councilwoman Hartak. Um, Hi, thank you all for this tonight. Um, and I wanna uh, thank Secretary Gwynn for uh, working on these underpasses um, with the 275 um, construction. I drove uh, under the Flora Vraska um, underpass just recently and I've, I saw more homeless people than I have ever seen before um, because it's widened up up there uh, somehow. And so, yeah, they, they actually, it's, it's, it's quite wide now, um, which is one of the residents' concerns. So I'm really, uh, I appreciate that you are trying to find um, solutions that aren't just chain link fences. Thank you so much. The, I know the community appreciates it and all the visitors to Tampa who come into that area um, will appreciate it. Will also, less maintenance, I would imagine. Um, but this is my very first TPO meeting and first tip um, from this side of the chamber. Um, so I don't know if this is possible, but going back to, I, I, there seems to be a confusion and I'm confused um, about what we can and can't take off. Um, so I would just wonder in the future if, if we could basically put it out that way to begin with. What is already done? What can't 
uh, it, because it sounds like the community is asking us to take this out, but we can't. So it would be nice to know when we come into this meeting, what is, and it would be nice for the community to know, because if we can't take this out, everyone's wasted their time. So is there a way in the future that you could show us what's not movable? D does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, well, I mean, it's actually the, it's the TPO's list. It's not necessarily our list, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, quite honestly, when, once it goes past, once it's funded for design, that's when it goes into the phase where the commitment's been made, the money's been invested, and at that point, you know, we both would have to agree to remove it. Um, obviously, when you get into the construction phase, you know, it's kind of hard to un or deconstruct what you've already constructed, so you got to kind of go forward. But um, I think there's a way to show, and I think you have been showing on this new list some of that to show what phase it's in, right? So I think they're, they're doing that. It's a good point. I mean, most people don't understand it. It's, it's, it's not always black and white where you can see. And in some of the ways we do our business now with accelerated projects, these phases overlap. Mm -hmm. Um, especially when we have, you know, stimulus dollars and things that, you know, you have to spend quickly. So um, we, we can certainly work with the TPO to try to make sure that maybe they put a red flag on it and says, hey, you're entering into the point where you can't back out of. Um, there, I'm sure there's a way to do that. It, it, that sounds great because it sounds like the board as a whole wasn't sure, wasn't, didn't know that I guess last year was probably the last year that it could have been affected. So in the future, it would be really nice to know also so that the community can focus on the things that are actually changeable. Um, and I, I don't mean that this isn't changeable. Like you said, we would have to agree on it, but maybe group them in that way. Something that we can affect and something that, you know, it, if you're getting RFPs back next week, we're, we're way past the point of being able to, to take it off. This so project I, did follow an unusual path um, that doesn't follow our normal five-year program path. You know, this project, because it, it was born out of the, if you want to call the removal of the previous TBX interchange that was the, the massive interchange that would have taken out the whole community. And so we came up with the safety and operational improvements. And then last year when, when money became available to invest in critical projects around the state, they offered it to us for this project, and we came and we approved it, and we decided to move forward. So it was a lot fast tracked, more than a normal, in the usual process. You would go through phases linearly that would take more time, and you'd have more time to digest it. This one was crammed in because of it was opportunity money that came available. Um, so hopefully, we won't have all our projects be as you know fast tracked as that, where you get into that mode. But this one, it did. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Legrand, I know you've been waiting patiently to speak. Well, thank you. And um, first, I want to thank my colleagues for allowing me the opportunity to participate virtually. Um, I also just wanted to quickly share that um, to respond to David's comments that he has also been a great colleague and partner, FDOT has been very supportive of part in our advancement of our projects within our limited funds. And as he stated, the article that was in the Business Journal today had some inaccurate statements there. And Hart has already engaged with a consultant to complete our application for a lane closure or, or a lane repurposing. And we are on target to submit our application by the end of this month and we're looking forward to advancing the project. So I just wanted to formally state, and again, thank David and his team for being supportive, and then also um, agreeing to work with the paper to make some corrections to the statements that they earlier, that they printed earlier, and then they later went back and did a correction. So just wanted to say that on the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, are there any other board members that have questions or comments before we um, move on to a vote on the tip? I don't see any at this, at this uh, Commissioner Kemp, go ahead. Um, I'll have to use your mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're sharing. <laughs> or, yes. yeah. Go ahead. Whichever. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is directly to do with the tip, but this is not the tip. 
And um, that's, um, you know, I've been on, on this side of this uh, issue. I mean, I've probably been to the TIP meeting for the last eight years straight, maybe the whole time Councilman Naniscalco has been here, and I've been five years on this side and like three years on that side. <laughs> and when we had 600 people here till two or three or four in the morning, um, and, and at least one very long meeting when I was uh, uh, on, on the commission. And one of the things that um, I had raised last year and this board, thank you, supported was removing from the tip the funding for I-275 widening north of the downtown interchange up to whatever it is, Fletcher Avenue, to remove that from the tip. What was planned is two 15-foot added lanes on either side to come all the way down. Originally, they were expressor toll lanes. They could turn back into that, as I understand. Um, and they were, uh, they, so that was 30 more feet of, of asphalt um, widening. And I think this year we've heard a whole lot about uh, footprint versus right of way. <laughs> and I was always very, very, very focused on uh, the footprint uh, rather than the right of way and always understood that that at meant adding uh, 30, 30 feet more of pavement to I-275 as it goes north from the downtown interchange up to Bears Avenue. Um, that and 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 as well, if you've been here for many years, you know that in the middle of the interstate, in that area, it used to be open. And at some point, it was closed and supported and paved over. So there's these lanes as you go back and forth that are uh, striped lanes right there by the center that are not usable, that are just asphalt, they're waiting to be, I'm not exactly sure what. <laughs> Um, but those lanes, those lanes are there. There is um, uh, pavement, there are additional pavement on either side of uh, those lanes. And um, we were, and I thank this board, and I know the community cared about this, um, we did support pretty overwhelmingly removing that from the tip. And that was a, a huge, important deal. And if we had that traffic coming in, we would have two more lanes of traffic coming down and hitting this interchange, which I, again, and I've said it many times, and I'm uh, grateful um, with FDOT for, uh, you know, the, there were two massive blowouts with express lanes all over the place and spaghetti and I just think it would have been devastating for this community the original plans um, we had the choice of Nobel we had the choice of uh, what we did now which was um, a more de minimis uh, interchange that suited I think the needs of what we see right now right now uh, and you know, didn't run all the express lanes through it and um, really um, looked, I think, at doing uh, a, the, the best um, we could with what we are facing. So we took, we took these additional 15-foot lanes off the interstate tip plan from the downtown interchange up to Fletcher or Bears. I'm not even sure which one it is. But... At any moment, at any time, those lanes can go right back on the tip. Three years from now, they go back on the tip. And what happens when the traffic, if those are built and the traffic starts coming down and if they're express lanes or whatever, what do they do? They, they, all the traffic piles up at the interchange to blow it out again. It's, it, we're facing this problem for the future. So there's another step that I learn needs to be done in order to really rethink our future with this. And that's to remove those two lanes, those two 15 foot lanes from the long range transportation plan. And that looks at what we can do for the future. And it's not a step that we take 
tonight. It's a step that we take to move in that direction. It's a process and it could begin tonight. And it addresses um, what we've been facing here with the interchange and the issues in terms of looking with foresight about how we plan and look at our transportation and the choices we make for the future and all the things that we've heard people saying here, I think for the last six to eight years. And so I, with that in the discussion and you know, all we've done, I'd like to, um, I'll, I'll, I'll put it out here tonight to make a motion um, to begin the process, and there's other times along the way it, it can be, uh, it will certainly be discussed or vetted. Um, it isn't like we do it tonight and it, it happens, but to make a motion to remove um, those two additional lanes from the LRTP, the Long Range Transportation Plan, uh, so that we can, um, so that they're not just there to say it's a priority that we want and at any time can be moved to the tip and to, to I'll rethink. Second, yeah. Thank I'll second. You. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Uh, Mayor Ross, I'm gonna call on you, but just to be clear, this is unrelated to the tip itself. Right. This is a separate item that, that you're, you're making a motion to, to begin the process of discussing. Mayor Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate the sentiment, and, I, and I'm not going on record saying that I would be opposed to this at some point, but I don't think that this is the right meeting for this to happen. I, I, if we're going to, what we're doing is trying to shackle future TPOs for from things that we don't know. We're trying, to, we're trying to make this as difficult as possible for this to come back by changing the long range transportation plan without any staff input, without any input from DOT, without any impact um, questions of what would this do to T-BARDA with their proposed regional rapid transport from Wesley Chapel to St. Pete, what's the potential impacts to that there's a lot of moving parts to this and and it, it may be the right thing to do and i may ultimately wind up yeah. voting in favor of it but i don't think this is the meeting to open this can when we don't have any input from anybody on our, on our staff commissioner kemp go ahead and respond thank you and i just like to um um uh, ms alden i think if she's is she still there mm -hmm. Okay, because as I understand it, it's a very multi-step process, but you have to start that process somewhere to even have the discussion. And right now, we are shackled by passports to the plan that was done, who knows, um, you know, decades ago, um, is now, you know, uh, with, with us now. So I think to rethink that, um, but it's a multi-step process. This does nothing but uh, you know, there's there's many places along the way, which I understand is a complex process. Ms. Torres, go ahead. Thank you. Well, th they're communicating with one another, I believe. I, so. What's the button? Okay. Um, yes, I just want to first cl clarification if this request is for an amendment to the current long range transportation plan or something that we consider for as we update to the 2050, which is beginning at the end of this year where we you know we start to look at our next uh, 2050 and if it is for an amendment to the current long range plan well that has to be noted noticed mm -hmm. and publicized and at a you know taken vote at a board meeting and for what I, I understood we needed to have some sentiment about moving in a direction like that so I guess um, I'll <laughs> I can request that maybe this is on a future agenda. I think there is a tremendous amount of support right now, and this is what we're hearing about, and this is what we've heard about at this June meeting for the last eight years um, for, for doing this. And I don't want to get stuck. I don't want future uh, TPOs um, stuck with this in the future. 
and dealing with this again. Um, I want to get it resolved, uh, however it gets resolved, to rethink looking at this because what this, uh, the impacts of what's on the books now is, you know, will affect this project that we have had so much opposition and has caused so much um, pain and discord and um, you know discussion in 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 opposition in this community. So I think it's really important that um, we move forward with uh, looking at this. And um, I guess I I could at this point maybe do a motion to have this set on our agenda for discussion um, at the next August possible. 10th okay. is our next meeting. Uh, sure. before, before we go to Commissioner Overman, Commissioner Myers, you had your hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner Kemp just addressed what I wanted to say. We'll put it on the agenda okay, for so our that, next that's, meeting. Okay, so I'm going to count that as the second to her motion yes. then. And, and uh, Commissioner yes. Overman has a question, but I believe Ms. Alden wanted to, to speak to the issue as well. Ms. Alden, are you there? Uh, thank you so much. Okay. And I, um, so I, I just wanted to add to uh, Gina's point of clarification about the process. Uh, there is a public notice process for proceeding with a, a long range transportation plan amendment. Um, we would also need to bring back some information to you about traffic impacts. Um, that's a, a typically accepted procedure for considering long range plan amendments of this nature. Um, so is it your wish that we would advertise this as an amendment to be voted on in August? Or would you like to in August just uh, look at what the uh, traffic impacts would be and then make a decision about whether to advertise for a long range plan amendment? I would say it sounds as though your your suggestion as a professional that does this is that um, we uh, begin to take the process. I really just want this process to start, and I want this, uh, you know, this board. Um, I know there's a desire in this board, and I don't want to ignore that this sits out there. So um, I guess at this point, I would I would say to begin the process in August for the long range. Uh, transportation plan, which you're saying the 2050, I want to do whatever process <laughs> we need to do to begin this discussion and not just, um, you know, sweep it under the table and not just let it sit as it is. So I think, I think your motion is to place it on our agenda in August and that will, uh, by its very nature, start the process because at that point we can get a staff report and people can make motions to go ahead and advertise or, or set hearings or move ahead accordingly. So if that's acceptable, I don't see any other discussion on that motion. Uh, let's have, go ahead and have a roll call vote on, yes, uh, Mayor Ross. Just to make sure I properly understand. So what we're making, the motion is just to have a discussion about this in August and bring, and just to, right, we're not making a motion here tonight that we're committing to this action, we're just gonna discuss it. And, and just to be clear, I was never asking for that because as I said before, it's a, it's a very complicated multi-step process. It isn't something that I was asking for or believed could ever be um, you, you know, done tonight or appropriately would be done tonight, even if it could be. But, uh, but it is something that I think at this meeting in particular, year after year after year has been a focus. We're hearing now, uh, you know, about, we're, we're talking about the past with the downtown interchange and other, other uh, areas, but I think it's really um, incumbent upon us to start to uh, entertain the feasibility of looking at this and um, look at our, our future plans uh, it, at this time, um, not with the vision of decades ago, but uh, of now, of what we are dealing with to um, move into the future and see where we, we come with that. And, and not to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you don't want to be beyond the point of no return before <laughs> yeah. you've committed to go beyond the point of no return. Uh, so uh, with that, we have a motion from Commissioner Kemp, uh, supported by Commissioner Myers. Please uh, call a roll call vote. Commissioner Cohen? Yes. Commissioner Kemp? 
Yes. Commissioner Overman? Yes. Commissioner Myers? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Councilmember Maniscalco? Yes. Councilmember Citro? Yes. Councilmember Hertak? Yes. Mayor Ross? Yes. Commissioner Kilton? Yes. Joe Lapano? Yes. Adelie Legrand? Yes. Greg Slater? Yes. Charles Kluge? Yes. The motion passes 14 to 0. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Smith? Thank you. Um, I have a question about an item uh, on, let's see, table two. It's almost the very, it's the second to the last item. Uh, the heart um, uh, heavy maintenance facility. Uh, and um, this is a, a, a project that's been one of Hart's priorities, the community's priorities, number one priority for, for years. Um, so uh, I'm just asking about having it at number 94, um, you know, penultimate project on the whole table. Um, sh can we, should we uh, move that up to reflect its importance? And um, you know, wondering if uh, Ms. Legrand has has some input. But first, let's start with um, staff to see um, why it's so low and um, whether we should move it up some. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question, Commissioner. Um, the reason why, the only reason why it's ranked so low is because our prioritization criteria aren't really amenable to ranking it any higher. Um, for major projects, the three performance metrics that we typically look at are uh, volume to capacity ratio, um, number of people connected to jobs in 2045, and because this is essentially an infrastructure maintenance project, uh, it doesn't hit the mark on either of those metrics. So we know that there's value to it. The criteria don't really fit that project. We placed it on the list. Um, as you see, there are a number of suggested funding types, so we're tracking those, and we would like to work with Hart staff to go after any of those grants uh, as they become available. But um, just plain and simple, the prioritization criteria don't fit for that kind of project. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you just still have the floor. Thank you. Um, you would be uh, getting federal money for this and passing it through. Is that how um, this? There are there are a number of um, possible ways to fund this. I would say that uh, surface transportation funds is probably not the best way because we would have to chip away at a $65 million cost, um, $4 million or so at a time. Um, so I think federal funds through the Federal Transit Administration, um, some other grant opportunities with bigger pots of money associated might be better waste of, uh, not better waste, a better usage of our time to go after. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Um, yeah, I'm still not comfortable with it because it seems to me that we've put county money yes. towards this. The city has put city money towards this with a, the uh, uh, idea that we would be working together to match the total. This is not something that can wait um, mm -hmm five years th that building is unsafe in some ways I mean I hate to put that on the record but the point is it's pretty I think it's uh, been put on the record elsewhere moldy so <laughs> and leaky um, so I mean what if we did what if I did make a motion to to put it up uh, let, I mean this is it, within the major projects um, it goes from 65 to 95. I mean, what what difference would it make if I were to make a motion and get board support <laughs> to um, move this up in the priority list? Um, I think that um, that wouldn't be an inappropriate motion by any means. In coordinating this priority table with Hart, we were told that priority 95 needs to happen concurrent with 94. And so that's actually a $125 million project if you take the two of them together. Um, but you're certainly able to chip away with whatever, man, whatever amount you feel appropriate. So if, if I were to, um, if 
I mean, the appropriate thing to do if we were to get uh, the board to agree to move it up would be to move both of them up? That's what we have been told by Hart staff. Um, I know that uh, Ms. Legrand is on the phone. Maybe she can speak to that. Um, but when the priority requests were passed to us, we were told that 94 and 95 have, have to happen together. Ms. Legrand, uh, is there a possibility you could speak to that? Yes. So um, thank you for raising this. And it was our understanding in the process, since we are getting funding from multiple funding sources, that we had to wait for the program to be updated so that we could also get the FDOT matching dollars. So what we understood was that we could come back at the end of the year with an amendment when we got the FDOT dollars for our 25 million that we're gonna get from their work program, coupled with the dollars from the MPO, and then move both of those projects forward, as well as looking at our other replacement facility or ancillary facility for the construction project. So if TPO staff is saying that we do not have to wait for this timeline any longer. We definitely would like to move this forward because it is our number one priority. So I'll defer to hearing from TPO staff to understand if that is not still the case. Um, Beth, would you mind chiming in? I'm, to be quite honest, I'm not certain that Hart submitted an application for SU funds for priority number 94 this year. I'm not sure about we the did eligibility. Not, right, we did not submit based on guidance that we needed to wait for the next phase of the process. So, and if that was conveyed erroneously, this is a great time to get it cleared up, but that's the way we were instructed. Um, Ms. Alden. So, there's probably confusion because we talked earlier uh, this past year. Uh, I think we spoke in November and then um, again in February and March about uh, repurposing the funds that the TPO prioritized for Hart for State of Good Repair, um, moving those from vehicle replacements to the, uh, the maintenance facility. Um, and so, so far we've We've processed a TIP amendment to move one year's worth of the funds. There are still remaining another four years worth of the funds that need to be shifted over um, from vehicle replacements to the maintenance facility. And um, I'm guessing that that's what Ms. Legrand is referring to. Um, in terms of how do we get the rest of the funding lined up for the maintenance facility? Uh, you know, because clearly even with uh, the TPO contributing funds, uh, the DOT, the county, the city of Tampa, um, there's still uh, a need to get uh, additional funding, federal grant support, for example. Um, and so to achieve that, it would be beneficial to have the project higher on our priority list. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, the TPO board made a decision to move up one of other one of Hertz other requests up to the top of the major projects category. Uh, and that was the request for a feasibility study for uh, passenger rail service on the CSX corridors. So I would suggest that there is precedent for simply moving this HART request up to the top of the major projects list, uh, particularly if HART has identified uh, the maintenance facility as a higher priority than the passenger rail study. And so um, thank you, Ms. Alden, uh, for that clarification. So as you, um, I would say, accurately recalled, we have been talking about this since last November, and Hart has formally stated that the heavy maintenance facility is our number one priority. So if you're saying today in this meeting that we can move it forward in on the list, on the higher priority list, that is something that we would like to do, as we've discussed in the past, and whatever it is that we need to do to make that happen, we're committed to doing that. Okay, okay, so thank you. And, and so, in, you know, instead of getting way in the weeds about um, 
uh, rejiggling and, and organizing a whole lot of this, I think the uh, appropriate thing to do would be, and I'll just make a, mo a motion to move those two items, uh, 94 and 95, the two, the two last two items, up to the top, I think, uh, to, to the top. I think it's clear that they are very expensive projects, that we have other um, projects that may come actually before them with uh, uh, that cost less, but at least to give that signal that these are not our last priority, they are our heart's first priority, Second. I'll make a motion to move them to the top. Second. Right, we have a motion Second. from Commissioner Smith, seconded by Mayor Ross. Any discussion on the motion? I, Ms. Councilman Citra, I know you want to speak. Do you want to speak no, to the motion? I'm saying, I was going, I'm seconding that. Oh, 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 I'm I thought you wanted to. That. All right, well, let the record reflect that Ca uh, Councilman Citro also Thank wanted you, to Mayor. be a second on that. Uh, Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. I'll be quick, but thank you for bringing this up, Commissioner Smith. Um, uh, Hart has desperately needed this um, for any, not, not just expansion, but just for regular, there's not space for the, the buses, there's um, flooding issues in the property, there's all kinds of issues with the building. It was a building that was built in the late 50s as a truck depot uh, building, and um, for some reason, uh, in the first several years I was at heart, it kind of was named as a priority and then kind of just uh, disappeared and we cannot any longer delay on it. So I'm, I'm really glad you raised it to, to put it forward on the list. It's extraordinary. It's, it's probably, to me, it's the number one uh, need in the entire region in terms of moving people is to get the fundamental structure, to get the uh, operations and maintenance center uh, rebuilt and to get one that's uh, sufficient for us for the future. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Councilwoman Hartak. Um, I'm also, uh, as an amendment, would be willing to take what's in 65 and put it in 95's place because as we found at the T Barta meeting, CSX isn't interested. So, um, you know but what? To move further, okay. Why don't regardless. we make a separate motion for that? Okay. If you want to do that separately, let's let's keep it clean in terms of what the motions are. Right now, let's just uh, take Commissioner Smith's motion with its second from uh, both Councilman Citro and uh, Mayor Ross, and uh, let's have a roll call vote on that. Commissioner Cohen. Yes. Commissioner Kemp. Yes. Commissioner Overman. Yes. Commissioner Myers? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Councilmember Mamskalka? Yes. Councilmember Citro? Yes. Councilmember Hertak? Yes. Mayor Ross? Yes. Commissioner Kilton? Yes. Joe Lapano? Yes. Adelie Legrand? Yes. Greg Slater? Yes. Charles Kluge? Yes. The motion passes 14 to 0. Okay, thank you. Now, Councilwoman Hurtak, if you'd like to continue. Um, I, I would just like to move, uh, make a motion then to move 65 a little further down. Well, I, I think we probably need some speci specificity uh, about well, exactly where you want to move it. Um, I, I'm open to suggestions since I'm a little new here, but I would think... Um, hmm. How about between 70, uh, after 75? Hmm? <laughs> right. is, there, is there a second to that motion? Or, or any other suggestions? Not hearing any takers. Okay. All right, Commissioner Overman. And, and, and the reason I couldn't second it is because I was going to offer some some information to assist with that that decision making process. If we move the, the part of the the uh, the CSX conversation is because it's been on our priority list for about 30 years, so we finally got it on the list. And Hart, according to our budget presentation that we recently saw, has it scheduled for for a being at least moved forward in 2027. So it isn't, you know, next year. 
but, but moving the the um, maintenance pro project and that the piece of land that goes along with it, uh, you know, ahead of the of 65, you know, I don't think is going to change the prioritization of as far as CSX is concerned. What we heard at Tibarda was that given that timing matters and CSX is wrestling with federal laws that have changed their game with Amtrak, they just don't want to talk right now. But it's not to say that there's not still on a regional level, which will be discussed on Friday uh, at, the, at the Planning Alliance meeting, uh, a true commitment of looking at the way passenger rail could be evolve over time um, in the entire region on the west side of Florida. And obviously that is a much longer long range transportation plan, but the anchor for that project is that item because it's the only transit agency right now that has the most gain from that exploration. So that's why it's important to keep it on the list. But where it ends up after the maintenance, I, it doesn't, my heart is not really in, in scheduled to begin that process until 2027, so. Commissioner Kemp. Um, and I guess it just gets pushed down the list right yep. after that, which um, makes sense to me. I'll tell you that I moved it from something like 95 to its current place last year <laughs> because I wanted to see uh, more focus on that and us um, it, keeping that in mind. It's a, um, the, the discussions that happen uh, at T-BART, I just don't think are uh, any kind of final uh, sentiment on that. So I, I just, again, think that there's, um, it's been discussed for a long time, I think it's, um, lots of possibility and lots of interest, in, and um, we can just uh, keep it on there and see how it moves. Okay. I did have a question. Yes, Commissioner um, Overman. Um, you know, we, we find ourselves occasionally with this no return list, so I keep kind of going back to it because every once in a while we get a gotcha, and I want to make sure it's very clear. Um, on item on the table two, Item 67, or priority 67. So it's on page 11, it's the first item that talks about the capacity of West Shore, and it makes reference to new express lanes. And earlier this year, if I'm not mistaken, or la uh, late last year, um, after COVID, everything sort of runs together. We've, we've been on a fast track. But we did have a discussion at the TPO level that the um, any approval or any uh, approval of any project that addresses express lanes that this board would have to specifically get a definition on what that really meant, right? It either was a toll lane or not. It was express lane or managed lane or what. So what I don't want to have happen by approving the item on page 11, table two, Item number, priority number 20, 67, major projects on pages 54, 57, and 58, where it makes reference to including new express lanes in two different places in that description. That means we are approving toll lanes. So can I get some clarification from the board or do we need to modify the description to preclude any use of toll lanes on that stretch of that project? Uh, I would, it, it, maybe Secretary Gwynn could provide some clarification on this, but I see a yes in the column that says beyond the point of no return on this item. So I, I'm not following that it's still open for discussion. So, you know, the West Shore Interchange project is probably eight to 10 years from opening up um, based on, on the current schedule. As we get closer to where we're going to open the projects, we have public hearings. We come back, we talk about the strategy. The strategy that was um, described in the PD&E studies and the SEIS and all that was a managed uh, toll uh, facility, but that doesn't mean that it can't change when we get closer to, um, to the actual opening of the facility. So there's other opportunities for the public and for you all to, to have input on that. Good. Yeah. 
So uh, just to be clear, there is still at this point, even though this is a no return, you know, yes, we have, we have no option to take it off the list, there is still a, a line that we will reach that will give you good guidance on whether or not we choose to use one method of managed lane versus another with, that would require tolls. Is that true? I, I, you know, what I would suggest is maybe at an upcoming meeting, because we still are a long way away from this being an implementation, that we come in and go through the process with you on how express lanes and toll lanes and all that work. Well, we've done that before. Yeah. You've presented that to us before. You've given yeah. us the various different methods that are possible. And at, at, I think I believe it was at that meeting that this board agreed that under n no assumptions that tolls were going to be the default choice when it came to express lanes, that it would have to be fully disclosed when we would be voting on any item that would include an express lane description that would in fact open the door for having toll lanes be the way those lanes are managed. Right, and, and that'll be part of the discussion we will have over the next few years. That that public hearing process where we go through the, the final recommendation is done much further than now. Um, don't know what the um, state of technology will be at that time. Don't know what the public uh, opinion will be at that time. So for us to say today that eight years from now we're going to make this decision. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that it's just not the right time to make that decision. The one, the, the concept that was used in the studies that were done before was the managed, uh, the congestion pricing on those toll lanes, but doesn't mean that it can't change. And we've actually changed it on some of our facilities around the state already. Um, they've gone to some where they've gone toll by time of day, static toll that originally were dynamic tolls. They've, they've changed it based on what they find the traffic situation is. Um, in some cases, there wasn't enough traffic using it, and so they changed it to where it wasn't, uh, you know, tolled. So I think we have flexibility in there, but to, to, to just make a decision today that yes or no would be just, you know, it, it wouldn't be the right time to make that final decision. I thank you very much for that answer. So for the record, we are not saying yes to tolls effective whatever today's date is. <laughs> no, a final decision has not been made. There'll okay. be a public hearing and a process we'll go through. Okay, that's what I wanted to get clarification because in the past we have inadvertently said yes when not realizing we were saying yes. Yep. So I think it's very helpful to make sure it's for the record that we are not saying yes to tolls at the moment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Overman. Uh, anyone else before we move on to the... Yes, Councilwoman Hurtak. I just wanted to piggyback on uh, what Commissioner Overman said. And I'm confused. How is this past the point of no return if it's not even in consideration for eight to ten years? Well, it's bad. Yeah, so this project is going to take about eight years to build. Um, we're advertising it for design build coming up... Uh, Probably in about three months, we're going to advertise it. We're going to hire a contractor designer to come in um, because it's, you know, overall a, a $1.2 billion uh, project and it's built in multiple phases. It's just going to take that long. The, if we could close traffic down between the end of the Howard Franklin and downtown interchange for a couple of years, we could probably get it done in two years, but keeping traffic going and, and making sure people can get to Joe's place. <laughs> and the port can keep running at all, it's, it just takes that long, it's unfortunate. So, so it does seem to me like it would be an appropriate time if the RFP is coming out in three months to discuss what we would want in the RFP, not toll lanes. It would, it would, would no, well, it doesn't really matter from that perspective, you know, tolling it or not tolling it, um, you know, is a, is a policy decision that's made. It's not, you don't have to toll even if you have it set up for tolls. Okay. So that, that's, you. A, you know, they, in Jacksonville, they were going to originally do tolls and then they opened it up and they're like, there's not enough traffic over there. We want more traffic to use it. Let's take the tolls off. And they did. And it, and it worked. So you can have flexibility within the strategy. Thank you. Um, uh, then as it stands now, I can't support the tip with this on it. Okay. Um, anyone else have any comments? Yeah, I just want to make a motion to approve the tip. As it stated. Second. 
Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Klug, seconded by Mr. Lopano. Uh, are there any other comments before we vote? Well, I'd just like to thank everybody for a very fruitful discussion tonight. Um, you know, there's a lot of really good stuff in here that, that we didn't get to go into detail on, but the fact remains that every year we hear the public pleading with us for transit and pleading with us for additional safety measures. And what we all know, some of us, I, I was laughing about Councilman Maniscalco's comment about being here so long. I, I actually, my hair was dark when we, when we started. Um, I wonder if I'll have any left by the time it's uh, done. But um, over the years, there's been an enormous frustration with our inability to deliver on major transit solutions for this community. And it is not an accident that the five county commissioners that are sitting up here uh, also voted to place something on the ballot in November to try to give our community some options about how to move forward. And safety, uh, safety and the idea of, if you wanna reduce the number of cars on the road, the way that you'd have to do that is by giving people other options. Those are really at the centerpiece of, of the direction that we are trying to move. And what we're doing here is the best we can do with the money we have. But as the secretary said earlier, and as all of us know, there's an awful lot of money left on the table from the federal and state governments that we don't have the money to match. And if we had the money to match that, we would be in an entirely different circumstance. So um, having said that, and we're gonna be, as, a commission, as commissioners, we're gonna be talking about that a lot more later in the summer and uh, into next fall. So with that, I would like to ask the clerk to take a roll call vote on the tip. Commissioner Cohen? Yes. Commissioner Kemp? Yes. Commissioner Roberman? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Councilmember Manistalco? No. Councilmember Citro? Yes. Councilmember Herta? No. Mayor Ross? Yes. Commissioner Kilton? Yes. Joe Lapano? Yes. Adelie Legrand? Yes. Greg Slater? Yes. Charles Clues? Yes. The motion passes 12 to 2. All right, thank you very much, everyone, for a really good discussion tonight. Um, is there any old or new business from board members? It, Commissioner, Councilman Citra. If, if I may, we usually have a fixture in the audience that is here for all our TPO meetings. It is his birthday, and I wish to wish, excuse me, I want to wish Mr. Ronald Weaver a happy birthday. Okay. Uh, I also just want to take the opportunity at this time to announce uh, some of us are going to be going to Haines City on Friday for meeting of the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance and also the TMA Leadership Group, which Commissioner Overman chairs. And uh, in addition to that, our next meeting will not be in July. We don't meet in July. We will meet August 10th. So I hope everyone has a good few weeks of summer, and we will look forward to seeing you in August. And with that, we are adjourned.